Council Member Johnson, thank you for uh, all of your work as our staffs and we have collaborated on this investigation focused on the mistreatment of military families in privatized housing on U.S. military installations. In the mid-90s, when the Department of Defense commenced the privatization of military housing, uh, it was envisioned that this initiative would lead to better outcomes for military families, safer, more reliable living conditions, healthy homes, affordable housing available to uh, families living on and around U.S. military installations. For years, however, this program has been plagued by problems. And when I visited Fort Gordon in the first few months of my term in the Senate, I asked the command if I could sit down with families on post to hear about their experiences living in privatized housing managed by Balfour Beatty at Fort Gordon. And the stories that I heard shocked me. I heard stories about maintenance requests that were ignored, maintenance requests that were never followed up on, and not just routine maintenance, but maintenance that impacted the health and safety of our service members and their families living in their homes. And those families at Fort Gordon, they asked me to take action. And so using my authority as the chair of the Permanent Subcommittee on Investigations and working closely in a bipartisan way with my colleague, Ranking Member Johnson, who in his past capacity chairing the Homeland Security Committee has led substantive oversight investigations of related matters, we embarked upon an eight-month intensive investigation looking into these allegations of mistreatment of military families at U.S. installations. We focused on Fort Gordon in Georgia and Shepard Air Force Base in Texas. And the results of this investigation are alarming, are disturbing, reveal injustice imposed on service members and their families, reveal grave risks to the health and safety of service members and their families, reveal neglect by Balfour Beatty, which is responsible for housing tens of thousands of military families, uh, and reveal not just neglect and, in my view, misconduct and abuse, but neglect, misconduct, and abuse that persisted even after Balfour Beatty pled guilty to a scheme to defraud the United States between 2013 and 2019. Today we're going to hear from service members who have joined us to share their personal family stories of living in Balfour Beating housing. We will hear from advocates, military spouses, who will share what they've learned from their personal experiences and advocating for the families who live on post and live on installations across the United States. And then we will ask tough questions of senior executives at Balfour Beatty, demand answers and accountability. Again, I want to emphasize this has been a bipartisan effort from start to finish. Uh, Ranking Member Johnson has been a great partner in this effort. I thank my staff and his staff for their tireless work reviewing tens of thousands of pages of records, interviewing dozens of witnesses. I thank our witnesses for joining us today, in particular the service members who I'll introduce after our opening statements, who have come to share their stories, who have displayed the bravery, courage, and dedication that we know and expect from those who serve in the armed forces and are doing a great public service by joining us today and sharing their stories. And with that, I'll yield to Ranking Member Johnson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I also want to thank the members of the military for their service and our witnesses for their testimony today. Um, I really appreciated the, the cooperation you, know, you and I had, uh, our staffs as well. Uh, and it's true, it's bipartisan. I always like using the, the term nonpartisan. And I think uh, what allows for that kind of nonpartisan cooperation is when you focus on things we all agree on. Uh, I'll keep my opening statement short. Uh, I'll enter my uh, written f f uh, statement in the uh, asset to be entered in the record. But let me just read just one paragraph from it, because this is, I think, the goal we all share. 
Uh, service members represent the finest among us. I, I don't think there's any dispute. We, we agree on that. They and their families make many sacrifices in service to this great nation. When stationed in U.S. military installations, these men and women should expect to live in conditions that will not damage the health and safety of themselves and their family. I, th I think that states it pretty simply. Um, and that's why we were able to, I, I think, do a really good job uh, digging into this, uh, going through all those documents. And again, I appreciate uh, all the work on the staff. Um, I, I think the, in the end, and I'm looking forward to hearing the testimony and asking questions, but the question that kept going through my mind throughout this investigation, going through our report, um, is you know, the statement, you know, fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. So you, you have a, a settlement, $65 million penalties and fines, and then two years later, it seems like it's pretty well, pretty much going on as, as it was prior to the fine being imposed. So I'm kind of wondering, you know, what, what is the military doing about this? You know, how, how can we get this under control? This seems to be a problem that has just plagued military housing. Military doesn't want to deal with housing, so you contract it out, out, outside. And then you don't set up the controls so the contractors do the type of job that we all expect. So, again, I, I appreciate the cooperation. Look forward to the hearing. Thank you, Ranking Member Johnson. Uh, we will now call our first panel of witnesses for this morning's hearing. I'll introduce the witnesses, and then you'll stand to be sworn. Captain Samuel Cho is with the U.S. Army and lived in Balfour Housing at the Fort Gordon Army Base in Georgia where he was assigned to the 202nd Military Intelligence Battalion from August 2019 until last month when he was posted to South Korea with the 1st Signal Brigade. Captain Cho and his wife have three children, and he comes from a family that has been devoted to national service. His father served in the 82nd Airborne Division. His uncle is a Special Forces and Ranger Qualified Battalion Deputy Commander, and his aunt is a Navy Nurse Practitioner. Thank you, Captain Cho, to you and your family for this extraordinary service. I would note Captain Cho is testifying today in his personal capacity and is not testifying in any official capacity, nor is he representing the views of the U.S. Army or any military service. Technical Sergeant Jack Fitoris is with the 366th Training Squadron of the U.S. Air Force and has lived on base at the Shepherd Air Force Base in Texas. In Balfour, provided housing since August 2020 with his wife and three children. He deployed three times in support of Operation Enduring Freedom and has been with the U.S. Air Force since 2009. Like Captain Cho, Sergeant Torres also testifying today in his personal capacity and is not testifying in any official capacity, nor is he representing the views of the U.S. Army or any military service. Ms. Rachel Christian is founder and chief legislative officer of Armed Forces Housing Advocates, or AFHA, a national organization representing military families that was founded in 2019. Thank you, Ms. Christian. And Ms. Jana Wanner is, excuse me, Ms. Jana Wanner is a military spouse who has lived in on-base housing at Fort Gordon in Georgia and at Fort Meade in Maryland and has become an advocate for other families struggling with housing issues on U.S. military installations, particularly at Fort Gordon in Georgia. On behalf of the subcommittee and the Senate, we deeply appreciate your presence today. Look forward to your testimony. I would ask you now to stand and raise your right hands to be sworn in and remind you that this testimony will be under oath. Do you swear the testimony you will give before this subcommittee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? Thank you. Please be seated. Let the record reflect that the witnesses answered in the affirmative. We will be using a timing system today. All of your written testimony will be printed in the record in its entirety. We ask that you limit your oral testimony to five minutes. Captain Cho, we'll begin with you. Uh, you are now welcome to deliver your opening statement. Good morning, Chairman Ossoff, Ranking Member Johnson, and members of the subcommittee. It is my professional and personal honor to participate in this proceeding regarding the efficiencies and privatized housing provided to service members and our families at Fort Gordon, Georgia, as well as other communities throughout the United States Army. And this housing community is, is furnished and provided by Balfour Beatty communities. Also, the personal experience that my family and I've had while residing on Balfour Beatty will be the crux of my testimony for today. Uh, a brief history about myself. I am a prior enlisted so soldier. I used to be an intelligence analyst prior to my commission as an officer. I currently have 12 years of service. 
Before my military service, I worked as a banker for J.P. Morgan and for uh, Wells Fargo as well. As Senator Ossoff mentioned, I have a family, my wife, and three children. My son, Nathaniel, he's 14 years old. I call him my pride. Uh, I have my daughter, Sherilyn, who is the subject of today's uh, testimony. Uh, she is my heart. And then also have my son, Luca. Uh, he's 11 months old. Uh, I call him my joy. Um, between my family and my service, I find my life to be uh, rather full and fulfilling. But the crux of my testimony today is due to the fact of my daughter, Cheryl in particular, the mistreatment and the negligence that she was subject to while we resided at 149A Cypress Circle at Fort Gordon, Georgia, circa August 2019 up until February of 2021. Prior to that, my family and I had never resided on any military installation. Uh, I had resided on a military installation uh, through my father and my mother uh, before my military service, but I do not recall ever seeing any the type of conditions that we have lived under while we were at Fort Gordon. My wife and I have found that my daughter's experience is life-altering and that it will haunt her as well as us for the rest of our lives. Uh, she is diagnosed with a condition called severe atopic dermatitis to the point where it's potentially fatal. Unfortunately, the, the basis of her condition was founded upon what she was exposed to while we resided on post at Fort Gordon by the home, which was managed by Balfour Beatty. My daughter, prior to her condition, was a very exuberant and bright and vibrant young lady, very social, very amicable, willing to talk to anyone, stranger, family member, friend, whoever it may be. Now, due to her condition, she is reticent in engaging with anyone outside of her immediate circle. The literal scars of her experience haunt her and plague her to this day. My wife and I have found that this is something that unfortunately will resonate with us for the rest of our lives. And all we seek is to provide the most factual and personal testimony that we can here today. I am very proud that I can stand here or stay here before the subcommittee and to everyone present that I represent my daughter and my family because I'm the only person that can suffer for her. I'm the only person that can truly show the world the narrative of what we had experienced <coughs> while we resided at Fort Gordon through the home that was managed by Balfour Beatty. It is my desire to ensure that everyone in the subcommittee is fully aware of the circumstances to include a timeline, to include key individuals, to include the locations, to include folks who are employed by Balfour Beatty, as well as certain members of the garrison at Fort Gordon as well. There is negligence across the board here, and it is my desire to bring that to light as conclusively as possible so that way an executive decision can be made that will positively impact families going forward. Unfortunately, my daughter will still have her condition to endure. Thank you for your time, Senator. Thank you, Thank you Captain Cho, for your testimony. Tech Sergeant Torres, we will now hear from you. Chairman Ossoff, Frankie Pepper Johnson, and members. And you'll need to activate your microphone. Chairman Ossoff, Ranking Member Johnson, and members of the subcommittee. My name is Technical Sergeant Jack Fay Torres, and I thank you for the opportunity to testify today. I have served in the Air Force for 13 years, and we moved into our home in August of 2020 at Shepard Air Force Base, Texas. After moving in, my wife and children started experiencing a wide variety of medical symptoms. After realizing we felt better outside of our home and realized that mold was likely a threat. The first major work order we reported was on March 4th, 2021 for our water heater. During the repair, a Belfer Betty technician forgot to isolate the water and gas valves. This caused the entire house to smell of gas and water began rushing out into our mechanical room and hallway. I vacuumed as much water from the carpets as I could and put a personal fan in the area. Afterwards, the maintenance supervisor assured us that it was not possible for mold to grow in the area and not to worry. This was the first time we believed that our work order history did not reflect the true state of repairs within our home. For example, the technician noted that he had placed a fan and picked it up when actually I had placed a personal fan. Issues with the work orders have continued while living in the home. Work orders will be open and closed before completion frequently, or worse, a work order will be attempted to be repaired, and when we report the issue is unresolved, a new ticket will be opened. 
the maintenance database then looks as if two different issues arose, when in reality, a superficial fix occurred and a new work order was created. On May 27th, we discovered waterlogged trim and placed a work order. Our issues were not resolved and we then reported it to the government housing office and resident advocate. When our issues were still not being resolved, we contacted the armed forces housing advocate and with their involvement, we located more moisture and mold issues in and under our mechanical room. I then reported it, reported our issues to my command and local congressional representative. On June 11th, we e emailed Balfour Betty to request a professional mold test. Balfour Betty did not promptly acknowledge the extent of mold or arrange for a professional mold test. At that point, we were frustrated with the delays and took it upon ourselves to send tape lift tests to a lab where it was confirmed that mold was present. Balfour Beatty dismissed our concerns. At one point, we were told that a large spot of mold in our mechanical room wall was just a burn mark. Eventually, on June 24th, a licensed mold assessor, Ecosystems Environmental, inspected our home. It was not until this day that an environmental work order was put in, in the system, four weeks after we originally reported our concerns. Their report dated July 2nd cited visible growth throughout the home. Elevated moisture levels were found in more than 175 square feet of our walls, including the bathroom and kitchen. They recommended that all impacted walls be repaired. Balfour Beatty then hired another environmental company, Exponent, to review this report, and on July 9th, they issued a new report that did not require all repairs of the first report to be made and simply stated that some issues could wait for a change of occupancy. On August 4th, we were displ displaced for the first time. We hoped that our problems would be resolved, but after moving back in four weeks later, we found many issues unrepaired. There was even visible mold underneath the mechanical room and in the kitchen. Work was completed with Band-Aid fixes or ignored altogether. We immediately reported the remaining issues via residential portal and the work orders were marked web entered. It was later changed to the category carpentry. New caulk was placed, cabinets were sanded and the issues in the mechanical room were ignored. The work orders were closed as completed, never indicating that mold was still present. Shortly after moving back in, my family and I began to experience the same medical problems we had previously. On January 10th, 2022, we discovered mold growing on our wall in our kitchen. A Belfort Betty technician indicated to me that there may be a slab leak in our foundation, but Belfort Betty has never provided us a complete scope of work. We were displaced again this time for 12 weeks. These displacements caused my family great amounts of stress, as you can imagine having a two, five, and eight-year-old without their comforts of home. I was also passed over a supervisory role due to my family's housing situation. I believe in, if the general upkeep of my home had been taken seriously by Balfour Betty, as was indicated in the first environmental report, our displacements could have been prevented. While hesitant to tell my family's story of how Balfour Betty has treated us, I remain hopeful that Congress will seriously address what military families around the country continue to experience. Our, family, our military families should not be forced to live in fear of their home, own homes. Thank you, and a special thank you to the Armed Forces Housing Advocates. Thank you, Sergeant Torres. Ms. Christian, your opening remarks, please. Chairman Ossoff, Ranking Member Johnson, and members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to testify before you today and for allowing the Armed Forces Housing Advocates to share the stories of thousands of military families that have been impacted by the systemic failures of the Military Housing Privatization Initiative. My name is Rachel Christian, and I am one of the founders of the Armed Forces Housing Advocates. AFA is a nonprofit organization that was formed out of necessity to provide direct advocacy services to military families living in privatized housing across the nation. Since May of 2021, we have assisted over 1,500 families residing in military housing. Personally, I have been advocating for families since 2018. AFA takes a grassroots approach to advocacy. This gives us a unique view of the current process and procedures in military housing across the United States. In the past year, I have seen environmental hazards such as mold, lead, asbestos, and raw sewage being improperly handled by untrained staff and work orders being closed prior to completion by Balfour Beatty employees. I have witnessed service members in tears due to the fear of losing their careers after Balfour Beatty attempted to use their commands to silence them for speaking further about unsafe conditions in their homes. I have seen denied maintenance requests and closures of work orders simply due to Balfour Beatty not wanting to foot the cost of completing necessary maintenance and repairs. At Whiteman Air Force Base, a large tree limb fell on a car which just moments prior held an infant inside. 
the request to remove the dying tree from the yard was denied by Balfour Beatty in the months prior to the incident. The most morally egregious behavior I've seen while assisting military families residing in Balfour Beatty homes is the ways in which individuals with disabilities are treated and their civil rights consistently violated. Disabled military families are being faced with excessive red tape when requesting reasonable accommodations and modifications to their homes. The excessive requests for documentation and personal information, as well as the length of time it takes to get a request approved, violates the law. It is inexcusable that a military spouse should need to be bathed by her husband because Balfour Beatty refuses to provide proper accommodations for her disability in her bathroom. Her husband, as the service member, should not be in constant fear of leaving for training or deployment because he is unsure if his wife will be safe in their home. The safety inside of a Balfour Beatty home is questionable at best. I have seen sick and injured military families that have been dismissed repeatedly when bringing forth their concerns that their homes are, have made them sick. A child at Fort Bliss tested high for lead in their blood. After certified testing was completed, it showed higher than allowable levels of lead-based paint dust in the home. Yet still, Balfour Beatty denied that the lead-based paint in the home was responsible and refused to abate or encapsulate the lead-based paint. That home is still available for unsuspecting families to move into today. These medical conditions are not only harming our military families, but are also costing military treatment facilities and TRICARE millions of dollars in medical care, which could be avoided if the homes were properly maintained. The issues I have cited are only a small portion of the problems, and they are not unique to one installation or location. They are mirrored from one to the other. Balfour Beatty often claims that the problems we see are regional with a few bad actors, but we strongly disagree with this notion. When corporate leadership is directing the actions of local employees, the issues are inherently systemic. A little over three years ago, I sat in this very building listening to the Senate Armed Services Committee discuss the deplorable conditions in military housing, including those run by Balfour Beatty. How many more cases of negligence, fraud, and civil rights violations must we present in this building before Balfour Beatty is properly held accountable and banned from receiving further government contracts as well as removed from their current partnership with the Department of Defense. Balfour Beatty has already admitted to defrauding the government, but it is not just the government that suffered in this case, it's the service members and it's their families. They are the ones being forgotten, pushed aside, and made sick by a company that continues to choose profits over people. When our service members are exploited by the very companies that promise to protect them, our troops are not operationally ready. No service member should have to choose between a costly, reasonable accommodation for their family member or purchasing groceries. No service member should be losing sleep on deployment, worried that their family is sick or injured in their home, and no service member and their family should be homeless while serving this great country. It is time that our service members and their families are all treated with the dignity and respect they deserve. The military community lost their faith in Balfour Beatty due to their continued disregard for the health and safety of the families residing in their homes. We believe that ending the partnership with Balfour Beatty is the only way to ensure the readiness of our service members and the safety of our, our families. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Christian. Uh, Ms. Warner, we will now hear your opening statement, please. Chairman Ossoff, Ranking Member Johnson, members of the subcommittee, thank you for the invitation to participate in today's hearing. My name is Jana Warner. I've been a proud Army spouse for the past 12 years. My husband is a Sergeant First Class, and he has been in the Army for 15 years. We have two children, one with special needs, who was enrolled in the department's exceptional family member program. Like most military families, our family has moved often. We are currently at our fifth duty station, but at Fort Gordon for a second time. During our first tour at Fort Gordon in 2013, we arrived from Germany and did not have enough time to look for off-post housing. After waiting in a hotel for over two weeks, we were offered a home that had an active leak from the refrigerator, cigarette butts scattered on the stairs, as well as dirt and roaches on the kitchen floor. When questioned about the condition of the home, the Balfour staff member stated that roaches are normal in Georgia and that the contractors must have accidentally left their used cigarette butts behind. Over the next few months, we had frequent work orders to include leaks, mold issues, an air conditioner that did not work properly, and at one point, it was declared a fire hazard. After five months of living in these conditions, we moved to a home outside of the installation. I began my advocacy four years ago while stationed in Maryland. 
After our own experiences as a family with the lack of appropriate accommodations for our special needs child and mold issues in our home, I decided to speak about the conditions military families are living in. After returning to Fort Gordon for the second time in 2019, I started hearing from military families living on the installation with various housing concerns. <clears throat> Myself, Mrs. Webster, and Mrs. Dykes created a private Facebook group that is specifically for Fort Gordon families with housing issues. On average, each month, we help dozens of families with the ongoing problems of Balfour's mismanagement of the homes on the installation. Lack of prompt response to repairs such as leaks, mold, as well as lack of transparency about the wait list for on-post housing. Sewage leaks, pest issues, these are just a few of the things that we frequently hear about from families. Work orders for maintenance requests go unaddressed or ignored for months at a time in some cases. More specifically, one resident has had work orders open since December 2021, requesting repairs to their master bedroom ceiling with water damage. The ceiling appears to be caving in from the damage, but maintenance has not addressed their concerns since putting the work orders in. Several other residents have reported similar experiences with leaks causing water damage, with limited communication for maintenance about repairs and work orders that have been left open with no timeline given for the repairs. When residents have requested a move-in checklist to document pre-existing damages, housing staff has stated that there is no official form to document those damages. Residents are then told to send an email to the housing office with photos and descriptions of the damages, and they will be kept on their file. However, after several residents had reached out to confirm their emails were on file to prepare for a move-out inspection, they were told that their documentation was never received. ADA accommodations request or other reasonable accommodations requests have also been ignored or denied. There are currently no standard proof requirements for accommodation needs. Balfour is inconsistent with the information that they request to prove the need for reasonable accommodations. Some families have made reasonable requests for accommodations and were promised one-level homes, only to arrive to find out that they were offered what they were offered was not a one-level home. Other families have requested ADA homes due to the medical need, only to be placed on a several months long wait list due to Balfour not leaving the homes available for need-based families. The fear, the fear of retaliation by Balfour and a lack of clarity on how to report are common reasons that have prevented families re from reporting their issues. Residents have frequently discussed what is sometimes described as verbally abusive staff that deters them from speaking up any further. For families that have never lived in military housing before, the process to dispute is even more confusing and unclear. The Tenant Bill of Rights and the dispute process were well-intentioned. But more oversight is still needed, such as more thorough inspections that are not just based on cosmetic appearance of the homes, but also ensuring that families with special needs do not have extra layers of red tape to have access to ADA homes or reasonable accommodations. Military families make sacrifices every day. A safe home should not be one of them. Thank you, Senators, for the opportunity to testify and for addressing the health and safety of military families. Thank you, Ms. Warner, for your opening remarks. Uh, I will now recognize myself to begin questions of our first panel. Captain Cho and Sergeant Torres, I want to thank you again in particular for uh, joining us and for your service to the country. Captain Cho, you recently deployed with your family to Camp Humphreys in South Korea, and you just flew 7,000 miles on a 17-hour flight to testify here today. Can you take a moment and explain to the subcommittee why you felt it was so important to be here? And if you wouldn't mind making sure your microphone is uh, close enough to, to capture your remarks. Thank you, Captain Cho. Thank you, Chairman. It's quite simple, my daughter. No one else will speak up for my daughter. No matter how many times I spoke up for my daughter while we resided on post at Fort Gordon, especially notifying Balfour Beatty throughout dozens of interactions, whether it was via work orders or whether it was in person, whether it was submitting concerns via telephone with their primary point of contact through their facilities manager there, it was all for naught. The reason why I'm here before everyone is because my daughter is still under the same health conditions that she initially contracted due to the home itself. And that we were informed that this is a potential lifelong condition, and this is also a potentially fatal condition if she is exposed to the right circumstances of black mold and mildew, which proliferated the home that we resided in while we were at Fort Gordon during our time there. The timeline that we resided there was from August 2019 up until February 2021. My daughter, her skin, once youthful and supple, is now reptilian in nature to where there were numerous times she would wake up in the middle of the night, hands covered in blood from her scratching while sleeping, and her bed sheets are also covered in her own blood. How do you explain 
to an eight-year-old child why she should endure something like that. If it was something that my wife and I could control, by all means, we would take responsibility and do the very best that we could as her parents to ensure that she is under those same conditions going forward. But the conditions that we resided in is due to outside factors beyond our control, primarily championed by Balfour Beatty, who provides direct oversight to the homes at Fort Gordon and across numerous military installations throughout the DOD. It is very important that I'm here today, regardless of however much time it takes for me to fly from one part of the world to another, so that way I can provide the accurate truth of what we endured. My daughter's condition is to the extent where she has received a very powerful and potent injection called Dupixent, which retails for between three to $5,000 per injection. Starting from July of 2021, excuse me, 2021, correct, up until February of this year, she received injections twice a month. I broached concern that if my military service were to be concluded prior to a retirement, then what would happen to my daughter? That means we will be potentially paying over seventy dollars to $100,000 in out-of-pocket expenses for an injection that she should receive due to the circumstances that she was exposed to outside of her control and our control at, Balfour Beatty, or at Fort Gordon through Balfour Beatty. Chairman, I don't know how to convey to you any more strongly how much of this has impacted her. Her sense of self, her sense of worth, of who she is, has forever been changed. Again, I mentioned that she was a very vibrant and social young lady, and now she is withdrawn, reticent. She has sought counseling services through her school. She has sought military counseling services as well to include the chaplain at my previous organization prior to my departure from Fort Gordon. It goes without saying that this is something that is always on her mind. There's times where normally most parents would ask their child, how was your day today? What happened at school? What did you learn? What was your homework? Do you have anything to give to us so we can sign to get back to your teachers? My first question is, how is your skin today? How do you feel today? Are you itchy? Are you bleeding? Show me your rashes. She resembles a burn victim at her worst. And her worst ebbs and flows because her condition will subside and then flare up periodically every month or two months despite any injection that we provide her, despite any ointment, topical treatment that we provide her, prescribed or over-counter. Yes, sir. And, and Captain Cho, had your daughter ever had rashes like that, the symptoms of the severe dermatitis that she's developed prior to moving into your Balfour home at Fort Gordon? She exhibited her rashes only after residing on post at Fort Gordon. And with your permission, I'm going to ask that slide 32 be depicted to the subcommittee, uh, which shows some of these symptoms. And you can take that down now. I want to ask you, Captain Cho, you went to see an allergy specialist on post a number of times in the early months of these symptoms developing in your daughter. What were you advised by medical professionals? The medical professional at the time um, who treated her throughout pretty much the majority of her condition, he informed my wife and I that at first he tried to determine certain factors were in play. If she was exposed to um, the only two other allergens that she has, which is a, a mild allergy to cats and dogs, uh, we responded quite promptly, no, because we do not own any pets. Our neighbors do not own any pets. My wife or my daughter does not interact with any pets due to that. Uh, it was shortly afterwards where, after conducting a series of skin tests and blood tests, that he determined that she has the uh, allergy or the condition for uh, dermatitis, atopic dermatitis, but to such an extent where it's severe, and we were informed alarmingly that it was potentially fatal. And Captain Cho, you then raised this issue with Balfour. Uh, they came in February 2020, understand they told you that they didn't find mold in the home. Was that the end of your family's concern with mold, or did you continue to raise the concern about mold in your home with Balfour in the months that followed? I fervently brought my concerns to Balfour Beatty in one form or another via communication, telephone or in person, or through email correspondence from the very beginning up into my departure from that home in 2021, February. And let me ask you, during this period in the middle of 2020 when you were reporting to Balfour uh, the urgency of your request that mold you were observing in your home be remediated, 
Uh, were you doing that mostly in person or by the phone? My apologies, Chairman. Can you ask uh, the question one more time? Were you making those reports and requests to Balfour principally in person and by the phone? We primarily provided our work orders via the portal that was provided to residents at Fort Gordon. Uh, and once we were notified by uh, my daughter's position of her condition, we submitted a work order for mold. A test was conducted. We were told at the time it was inconclusive, that it was negative. But we continue to press the point, and we were told to contact the manager of the Balfour Beatty organization there at Fort Gordon directly. I was actually handed her business card, and that going forward, I needed to communicate with her directly or with her staff, to which I attempted to numerous times. So let me just make sure I understand, Captain Cho. Were you specifically instructed by Balfour personnel that you should, moving forward, raise these concerns directly verbally or by phone rather than via the online portal? That is correct. So Balfour personnel told you to cease using the online portal and instead to place those requests for help directly in person or by phone? Yes, that is correct. Not just a supervisor. It was the manager of the Balfour Beatty communities at Fort Gordon herself. Thank you. We're going to dig more into uh, your story and Sergeant Torres' story in a moment. I'm going to yield in a moment to the ranking member. Before I do, I just want to ask you, uh, to turn, Captain Cho, to Exhibit 2. This is an email that you sent to uh, Ms. Paula Cook at Balfour yes. months and months later, after, as I understand it, your requests for assistance with mold in your home had been ignored for months. You had been instructed by Balfour personnel, rather than using the online portal, to place those requests verbally or by phone. You, at the advice of your doctor, had then sought to break your lease. Balfour had sought to prevent you from breaking your lease. You had to engage your chain of command. Yes, that's correct. Eventually, after engaging your chain of command, and again, this is while living for months in a home where there was mold and your daughter's health was severely impacted, you finally were able to get out of that home. Yes, that's correct. We're going to get into how Balfour nevertheless then pursued you for collection. But I want to just ask you to read... The final few sentences on the second page of this email. Beginning with, I am just a soldier. Do you see that, Captain Cho? In the middle of the final paragraph of this email? I am just a soldier, husband, and father, attempting to reconcile why this had to take place. My family and I were not aware that we were at the mercy of executive decisions made at Balfour Beatty, which were detrimental to my daughter's health. You, Ms. Cook, along with your representatives, could have accomplished much more, yet thus far have chosen not to. Thank you, Captain Cho, and Sergeant Torres will engage with you in the second round of questioning. At this time, I yield to Ranking Member Johnson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I think I got one of my first questions answered, is your daughter improving at all doesn't sound like she is at all. No, no Senator, she is not. So I, I want to explore, because I think a number of you talk, mentioned retaliation. Uh, that would be retaliation by your command, right? So I, I want to understand the, the, the finger-pointing, the shifting responsibility in terms of what all's trans, transpired here. Um, Captain Cho, your daughter was treated by military doctors? She was treated initially on post by military doctors, and then she was referred off post as well. And she oftentimes went back and forth between the two. So do the military doctors, did they, did they assign a cause to her skin condition? I mean, did they say this is, you know, this is typical of a, a rash brought about by mold? Only at the initial period. Uh, after her two initial appointments, uh, he, the epidemiologist made the determination that it has to be something that's triggering her condition specifically, and if she's only going to school and home, that it has to be something either at the home or the school itself. Did, did the doctor or anybody in the medical uh, clinic 
try and follow up to see what the conditions were in the home that might have been given rise to her skin condition? Uh, yes, yes, he certainly did. He definitely followed up with my, my, myself and I. We corresponded via uh, phone communication as well as email dozens of times to try and pinpoint the cause of her condition, which he surmised at the beginning, but he did not want to influence me indirectly or directly that it was the home itself. So did he, did he then advocate for you to uh, the base commander? No, he did not. I had to go through outside channels um, to have the, uh, the garrison command uh, eventually become involved. So, so what was the response from garrison command? Quite frankly, I was told by the garrison commander and the garrison sergeant major that they thought that this was not founded and that my daughter's condition was not predicated upon being exposed to mold at the home itself, to which I was quite upset about. So, so they just dismissed uh, any, any connection between housing and your daughter's condition? This was after several months of waiting for the garrison command team to make an executive decision to fund our move off post or at least give us the opportunity to break our lease at that time. That's correct. So then your, your only channel of, of uh, addressing this was then to go to Balfour? So, I, used, so, I mean, you were pretty well left on your own to deal with the situation. You, you got no help from your base commander, your garrison commander, or anybody in the, in the military chain of command. The base commander himself, I don't believe he was aware of my family. It okay. was the, the garrison command. But I used concurrent lines of effort to try and mitigate this between the physicians and him providing memorandums to state that my daughter's condition is what it is, as well as my chain of command, as well as the garrison command. I found that the garrison command failed me. I found that the physician was only tied because he can only do so much. He is not a person of influence. He can only provide facts and his findings to whoever reviews that information. So I had to use my direct chain of command, which they in turn actually determined that uh, this was warranted, and they influenced a, the change that was necessary for us to ultimately break our lease and leave the, uh, the home itself. So, so in the end, you did get help from your chain of command in terms of at least getting out of that housing? After much effort, yes. Did, did uh, somebody else move into that house after you then? Immediately after. Uh, so, Sergeant Torres, I think you're kind of understanding my line of questioning here. Can you kind of relay your experience in terms of, I'll, I'll call it a runaround. You know, what, what type of runaround did you experience? And you, uh, you mentioned retaliation. Can you be more specific in terms of kind of what happened as you just tried to get your issues addressed? And again, I see from your testimony, your family experienced a wide range of symptoms. Yes. Um, get the microphone as quickly as possible. I'm a little hard of hearing. Yes, uh, I told my uh, um, Bell for Betty about all of our issues, and when we were trying to get it all addressed, and we were not getting anywhere, you know, we went contacted government housing office and even with, you know, contacting them and the resident advocate on the base as we were still not getting the help that we needed. Uh, eventually, we, you know, we... So just, just back up, describe the, the government housing... We, we notified them, the government housing office. Now, and, is, is that in the military chain of command or... Yes, sir. Okay. Yeah, in military chain of command, you know, and they, they report up to they report they report up to the like the base and wing commander. So if there's any issues, you know, we address to the government housing office, and they kind of advocate or help us out to kind of contact the ho um, housing, you know, Belfort Betty, in terms of hey, do you know, there's issues in the homes, mm -hmm. and you know, can we get these issues addressed? And even with contacting them, we had to constantly email them. Uh, we had to request them to show up to the inspections because if we didn't, they weren't going to show up. And we kind of were trying to prove, like, hey, we do have issues in our home. Can you please show up? And then we were getting nowhere. We had to actually resort to um, requesting for an advocate out at an Army base, you know, you know, an hour away to get any help. And, you know, Sarah Klein has been done more help to us for our family at a completely another base on our Army post than the advocate and the government housing office on my base, and even come to the point where um, when we were being dislocated, my commander notified me that I was being dislocated, which I didn't even heard from, and 
he was trying to get information because he wasn't in on any of the information when that's actually the government housing's office supposed to be telling the wing commander and the base commander about our issues, and he didn't even know nothing about our issues. But so, our so is, is it fair to say that the government housing advocate didn't do much advocating for you? No, they didn't do anything. Pretty well just blew all. off your concerns. Correct. Um, Ms. Christian, you obviously have dealt with, you said, 1,500 uh, individuals like uh, Captain Cho and, and Sergeant Torres. Can you kind of summarize what you're seeing, or do you have some particular examples? I mean, is this, is this very typical that, that there's just, it's just a big runaround, there's a bunch of finger pointing and nothing ever gets done? Absolutely. Um, you will see this everywhere um, that you go when you're trying to get assistance um, to get any even minor request, um, you know, completed in your home. We're, these are, you know, cases of systemic issues in their home, but even something as simple as, you know, um, I need some, like, the toilet re because it's going to start leaking. Like, you're not going to be able to get somebody to come out to your home to fix that um, in a timely manner, and if you do try and seek assistance from, like, the government housing office, um, they will tell you flat out that they have um, no power to force um, Balfour or any of the other housing companies to act in your home and that their, their scope is limited. And then when they go up to the installation level to go see JAG um, or go see an, an advocate on the, uh, on the legal side, um, a lot of our families are being told, maybe you should get a lawyer um, from the base legal offices, which is not a, something that we need military families concerned about trying to understand or a process that they should be really having to go through to get simple fixes in their homes. So I think so I'm, I'm over time. I think the, the, the phrase you just used, the, the agencies or the, within the chain of command that should have the power are telling members of the military they have no power. Correct. I think that's kind of a key part right there is, is that true? And if they don't have the power, why not? You know, why hasn't the military empowered them to, to make this right? But uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Ranking Member Johnson. Senator Carper, you're recognized for seven minutes. Thanks uh, so much. I had an opportunity to personally welcome and greet uh, our witnesses a few minutes ago. We have a number of, we all serve on a number of hearing committees and subcommittees. We're doing other hearings, so I'm going to be in and out here today, but thank you and welcome. Uh, a little bit of background, uh, retired Navy captain, Vietnam veteran, last Vietnam veteran serving in the, the U.S. Senate. I've been privileged to uh, literally live in military housing in places around the world in, in the past. And uh, to represent the Dover Air Force Base for, uh, as a congressman for 10 years, as a senator for 21 years, and as a governor uh, for eight years. I love that base. In fact, my, uh, our community loves the Dover Air Force Base. There's something called the Abilene Trophy. I don't know if anyone's ever heard of the Abilene Trophy before, but it's a, an award that's uh, uh, made to communities at Air Force, an Air Force Base every year uh, around the country where the, the community's just gone the extra mile to make uh, sure that the men and women of the Air Force in that community are welcomed, loved, and uh, we take uh, really good care of them. So well, I, think, I don't think there's any community in America that's won the Abilene Trophy more than Dover. This is something that's part of our, our DNA. I might also add, I don't know that any um, uh, airlift base, Air Force airlift base around the world has won the Commander Chief Award more than the Dover Air Force Base. And not only do we have these huge aircraft, C-5s and C-17s, but we also have uh, we, uh, or the place where, as I think most people know of Dover in, in this country, is the place where the remains of our fallen heroes are returned to uh, this country from abroad and they're re reunited with, uh, with their, their families. So the, uh, the, we, we peel, care a lot about the folks who live there. When, uh, I, I remember a time uh, when, uh, when I was uh, earlier in my, my time in public service, when we had uh, base housing, uh, that um, families could stay in and others uh, in, in the, uh, the, uh, the Air Force. And uh, it was okay, but not great. And the same situation around the, uh, the, the country. A lot of base housing, government, uh, government housing, some of it was pretty good, uh, some of it was not very good. And uh, we, uh, I think it was during maybe the Reagan administration, I might be wrong on the timing there, but one of our uh, administrations decided that we ought to try something different. Uh, I like to say, find out what works, do more of that, and to see if we could f provide better housing for, for our, uh, our families. 
And the, uh, the idea came up with sort of a, a public-private partnership where a private sector would build and literally uh, run uh, largely um, the uh, base, base housing in partnership with the local commands. Good idea, a good idea. Uh, and in a lot of bases, um, it's worked just fine. In some bases, including Dover, not so well. And uh, we uh, started hearing, uh, oh gosh, three or four years ago from uh, families on our base that uh, the, uh, some of the, the problems with mold and leakage and that kind of thing uh, were uh, uh, of concern. And the uh, families wanted something to be done about it. The, uh, the company that uh, was, uh, in, uh, was the, they had the contract for, for housing in, uh, on the Dover Air Force Base uh, was not uh, responsive to, to those concerns. And we worked very closely with the uh, commanding officer of the, uh, the base, the wing commander, and others on the base to make sure that, the, the kind of, that, that, that our families uh, receive the kind of treatment they, uh, they deserve. And the, uh, we also pursued this with the, the, uh, the Committee of Jurisdiction, that's the Armed Services Committee. About two years ago, the Armed Services Committee passed legislation at my urging, the urging of a lot of folks in our bases around the country to better ensure that this uh, model of providing base housing for families, uh, that it uh, was improved. And uh, the, uh, the, you know, the preamble of the Constitution, which was adopted, believe it or not, five miles from the Dover Air Force Base, first adopted, ratified five miles from the Air Force Base. It starts off with these words, in order to, to, uh, in order to we the people of the United States, in order to provide a, a more uh, perfect union, a more perfect union. The idea is everything we do, we can do better. The expectation under those who supported the, the change in, uh, in law embodied in the defense, uh, 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 NDA, the National Defense Act, was we got to do this better. We have to do this better. And I think, Mr. Chairman and to our ranking member, this hearing is a good opportunity to begin some oversight on the, the work, I think good work, that was done uh, bipartisan way two, uh, two, uh, two years ago. So with that as a, a preface, I want to uh, just jump uh, to a, a question or two if I, if I can. And uh, for, uh, for each of the witnesses, please, uh, start, start with Captain. Uh, Captain, uh, in your view, were the reforms adopted by Congress through the, uh, the, uh, the Defense Authorization Act uh, two years ago, were they satisfactory? Have they made the kind of difference we'd hoped for for mil 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 military families? No. Okay, talk, tell us more. I like to be precise and, and succinct, but tell us more. For my family, if we have black mold in our bathroom, behind the walls, on the ceiling, on the shower curtains, in the children's bedroom, and we have used every avenue of communication to state that this is a concern that is ongoing, and if Balfour Beatty is acutely aware that my daughter has a serious health condition predicated from this, but yet no response, and in certain times we were told that we are lying about this, conclusively no. Yeah. The, um, let, me, let me ask uh, 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 our, uh, is it, uh, I want to get your rank right. Go, go, just go ahead and tell me. Tech, yeah, tech? Yeah, I'll go ahead. Same question. Uh, we, we spent a lot of time, the Committee of Jurisdiction spent a whole lot of time trying to get the root, of the, the root cause of this problem and said, let's try to fix it. One of the things they did is they, they basically said to the commanding officers of the base, like in our, in our base, the wing commander, say, you have a responsibility here to do something to fix this problem. You know, let's take, uh, take charge. And w that's what's happened at my base, Dover. Please go ahead. Yes, uh, even with all of our issues, it seemed that, like, uh, even when the base commander and wing commander involved, like it seemed like they still ha didn't have really the power to, because we requested to move to a different section, and even with then, is they, you know, they couldn't get the, had, didn't have enough power to really move us to a different section, all because I didn't have the rank required for that section. I even asked, I was like, hey, I'll even cough up uh, the difference in terms of BAH out of my own pocket, mm -hmm. just so we not have to live in the area where mold was known to be in, in in a certain area of base housing. Okay. Um, Ms. Christian, uh, really same question. In terms of the, the changes that, the, that we'd hoped for and expected coming to the 2020 uh, 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 legislation, um, yeah, I, on, I, would, I was really hopeful when Tenants' Bill of Rights and those pieces of legislation came down. Um, our team was really excited to see the implementation of them, but it's not working. Um, we have 10-page leases that are now 110-page leases that military families are having to read because they were trying to create a universal lease um, that would simplify things, but really it 
exacerbated the problem, um, as well as the formal dispute process and is, is 48 steps for um, Air Force um, service members. Um, you have to take 48 steps to do the formal dispute process, um, which is unacceptable. And the families that we are seeing that are trying to use the dispute process or trying to even say like, oh, we need a habitable home because the Tenants' Bill of Rights guarantees a habitable home, the housing companies will come back and ask us our definition of habitability. So we have such a broad language in that, um, especially with industry standard being listed. You're, you're you know, expecting industry standard, but that's not across the board. Um, so the oversight feature for the commanders, um, I would love to say that I've seen that go well, but that's where we see the most retaliation because now those installation commanders, now they're not all bad actors in that, um, but there are some who see this as a number that they're trying to not rack up on their installation for complaints because it's going directly to their leadership and it's going to reflect, reflect poorly on them. So I have witnessed... Um, installation commanders giving misinformation to disabled families about what the Fair Housing Act means. So they're not people who should be giving that type of information um, and trying to sway an individual one way or another to just stay quiet. Ms. Right. Um, Vanner, I'm, I'm out of time, so I, I, I'm, uh, I'm going to ask you to answer the same question for the record and, and just and with a, uh, and, and then in the weeks to come. Mr. Ch uh, Chairman, I think this is an important hearing. The, the, I think the question for me... Um, and the issue here is uh, why haven't the reforms that were adopted two years ago uh, worked better? I like to say if it isn't perfect, make it better. And uh, we have there's there's work to be done here. And the I think this uh, subcommittee can provide very important oversight and work in conjunction with the uh, the authorizing committee, Armed Services Committee, to get a better result for our families. That's what we want. Last thing I would say, uh, with a real strong economy, a huge number of jobs been created in the last uh, year or two. And the uh, uh, one of the questions I always ask when I go to the base to meet with the wing commanders and so forth, I ask the question, how are they doing in retention and recruitment? Always ask. And one of, the, one of the keys on retention and recruitment is how, fa how happy is your family, including how happy is your family with where they're living and the living conditions that they, they face every day. So this is, this is a, a recruitment and retention issue as well. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Carper. Senator Hassan, you're recognized for seven minutes. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Chair and Ranking Member Johnson, for this hearing. I want to thank the witnesses for being here, for your service, and for your willingness to speak out about uh, such a critical issue uh, for so many of our servicemen and women and their families. Um, I am deeply concerned by the testimony we have heard today and the impact that similar may, conduct may have on my constituents. New Hampshire is home to Portsmouth Naval Shipyard, and the shipyard's nearby private military housing is also managed by Balfour Beatty. So, Ms. Christian and Ms. Warner, you have talked about this a little bit just now with Senator Carper, but how widespread is the misconduct by Balfour Beatty and other private housing contractors? You will see it at every installation you go to. So 55 Balfour Beatty installations, I cannot come up with one where I haven't seen a, an issue with work order um, closures prior to completion or any type of mistreatment um, of military families. Thank you, Ms. Warner. Uh, I agree. It's widespread all over every base that is managed by Balfour Beatty. Um, work orders will remain open for months at a time, and um, ADA accommodations are not properly addressed for special needs families, disabled families. Um, so, Thank you. I'm going to follow up on that last point in just a minute, and I appreciated uh, the testimony just now to Senator Carper about why things haven't gotten significantly better since the 2020 NDAA provisions. Um, and uh, we'll follow up with you on that as well. I want to go, uh, Sergeant Torres, to a different issue. Your bad experience happened just last year, more than a year after the passage of private military housing reforms in the fiscal year 2020 National Defense Authorization Act. I want to dig into your experience to better understand what additional actions Congress may need to take. In your testimony, you said that Balfour Beatty misclassified your work request to address mold in your home as another type of repair, such as carpentry. To your knowledge, did the work order system retain any information about your original classification? classification of the repair request as a mold request instead of a carpentry request? 
Uh, no. So when we originally when we look at the report, it, it would be you know classified as one something that's in there, and then maybe the, you know a day or a couple of weeks later, it'll be the title will be changed. Um, in terms of my, like my background, I do, I'm a HVAC technician, heating and air conditioning technician. So I'm working on work orders all the time, and I'm able to track, you know, and look at these kind of stuff. And I know for a fact that if a, a customer puts in a request for some, a work order, the title should not be changed, and it should not be closed before completion. Right. You always have to verify, hey, did we fix it? Is it actually fixed? If not, then you're going to have to reopen. If it's closed, then you reopen the same work order. At least right. this is how it's done in the Air Force. We right. reopen the same work order, not close it and then open a new one. Right. Um, so I just want to confirm here. You are saying that no matter what you put in your initial work request, in your experience, Balfour Beatty was able to change the final record, classify the request as they preferred, and say whatever they wanted in the request record. Yes, like changing the title, even the date. The date was open, date was closed, um, all any remarks and all that stuff. Um, we have like screenshots of report histories of it being one thing, and then the dates and everything be changed on another, and it would never match up. Okay. Even to this day, the work orders are still being changed, and I even received tech messages that say work orders being closed out, even though we're being displaced for 12, mo uh, 12 weeks. It's saying right. that the work order was still closed out weeks before. So I want to follow up on, on both what you just said and what you just said about closing out the work orders. Um, you have said that the work orders would frequently be closed before the work was complete or satisfactorily addressed, or that work orders would be closed after superficial fixes were complete, but without addressing the root problem, resulting in additional work orders later on. Did Balfour Beatty ever give you the option to keep work orders open when you did not believe the issue had been adequately addressed? If yes, were you pressured to close those work orders at all? No, we don't. Ha we didn't have any um, control over if the work order was like closed or if we can reopen it or not. Right. That was just pretty much. They were, all they would just tell us is just open a new work order. Okay. So when that is really deeply troubling. It's really concerning. Um, work orders are there to help residents get their problems fixed, as you've pointed out in your own experience as a technician. And if a resident doesn't believe the work order was adequately addressed, they should be able to keep the work order open until it's been completely addressed. Um, Ms. Warner and then Ms. Christian, I want to turn back to you on the issue of uh, families with disabilities. In both of your written testimonies, you highlighted the struggles that military families with disabilities experience when trying to request legally protected accommodations from Balfour Beatty. This includes requiring excessive documentation to prove the disability, making it extremely frustrating at best to request accommodations. What, if any, information does Balfour Beatty give to potential residents about the process to request legally protected accommodations for military family members with disabilities before they decide to live at a Balfour Beatty residence? Are you aware of any standardized process for requesting accommodations? And I'll start with you, Ms. Warner. Currently, there are no standards that Balfour offers to families. Um, they report to us often that they will ask for excessive things such as uh, full-blown medical records, right. and there is no even just a standard form that the medical provider can sign to state that the family has the need for ADA accommodations or special needs requests. Um, there is a medical waiver that um, can move the families up on the wait list if they are waiting for an ADA home or just a one-level home, but they are discouraged from using that waiver. Okay. Uh, how are they discouraged? So um, I can tell you personally, yeah. our family is going through that process right now, and the regional manager assured us that if we sign that waiver, that every military family that has been waiting on a house in that neighborhood, if we moved ahead of them, they would come after us. Wow. Ms. Christian, anything to add? Um, I would just like to add that we as an organization um, follow what, what the Fair Housing Act says and how families should um, provide medical documentation. Like, there's, there's no real way for them to do so, so we follow what federal law is. And even when providing medical documentation from physicians stating, the, stating that there is a disability, what their accommodations requests are, those are still denied um, by local levels and requesting more information, which um, is just a violation of their right. civil rights. 
And it is really disturbing that a contractor for the United States military that is supposed to be there to serve the men and women who serve all of us and keep us safe and their families is not complying with longstanding federal law. Um, and there are plenty of examples of how to meet the accommodation needs of families with disabilities. Uh, this is not new. Uh, this is often quite straightforward. Um, and I would look forward to continuing to work with all of you uh, to ensure that we make um, significant process here and that one of our contractors follows the law of the land. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Hassan. I'm going to yield myself an additional seven minutes. Other senators may be en route to ask questions of this panel. Captain Shaw, I want to return to your story for a moment. Take us back to the summer of 2020. As you testified earlier, you've been instructed by Balfour personnel that you should submit your requests for mold remediation, not via the online work order system, but uh, ver verbally or by the phone, correct? That is correct. And as you're making those requests of Balfour personnel throughout the summer of 2020 and your doctor's health condition continues to worsen, what response do you get? No response. No response. And am I correct that your doctor's physician shortly thereafter advised you you needed to leave the home? That is correct. So you've been instructed by Balfour staff that you should place these requests verbally rather than via the online work order system. You've done so repeatedly. Your daughter is sick. You've seen mold in the home. You're getting no response. Your doctor tells you you need to move out of the home, so you approach Balfour to break the lease. What happens then? I asked Balfour if I would be given the opportunity to break our lease or at least at the very minimum be provided another home to reside in so while they can at least mitigate the conditions of the current home that we were at. We were categorically, categorically denied both of those choices, and Balfour stated quite clearly that we would have to continue to and honor the lease that was in place at that time. So you've repeatedly reported mold and gotten no response. Your doctor has told you that you need to leave the home for the sake of your daughter's health. She has now a severe dermatological condition. You ask Balfour how to get out of the home. They tell you you can't. Yes. It culminated with um, I submitting something called a uh, ICE comment which throughout the DOD is a, considered a very serious comment system or a feedback system where we can provide a feedback regarding certain services, whether good or ill. And in this case, it was definitely not a, a positive feedback that I provided. Um, I was contacted by a supervisor at Balfour, Gordon. Uh, Teddy Tripp was the gentleman's name, who told me that basically we would have to continue to reside in the home and that there were no other homes available and that there are essentially no other options available. I responded in kind by saying, when I was told personally, very specifically, by the Fort Gordon manager at the time, Samantha Dayer, February of 2020, when our home had the initial test for mold conducted, she handed me her business card and encouraged me to contact her verbally or coming by the office to seek her out. I adhered to that as strictly as I could. But in the interim, we, my wife and I submitted work orders. And whenever a technician would come over to take care of a leaky faucet, a broken cabinet door, whatever the case may be, we told them there's mold in our upstairs. There's mold in our room, in our daughter's room. There's also mold in the bathroom as well as present. Uh, we were told every single time that that mold would be addressed by the management and that the management would be in contact with us at some point in time. That never took place at any point in time. So you raised these requests repeatedly with technicians who were sent to the home and by the phone with the office as you were instructed to by Balfour personnel. You get no response. You're told by your doctor you need to leave the home. You approach Balfour to say you need to leave the home. They try to prevent you from leaving the home, and they also accuse you of lying? That is correct. Even the day before we officially moved out, my family had already relocated to an off-post uh, home. But in February of 20, excuse me, January of 2021, I was at the move-out inspection. But the day before, there was a couple of things that still needed to be addressed that hadn't been. So I made sure that a Balfour a technician came out. That gentleman came out. He fixed the issues that were there. It was like a broken light bulb and something else. I ripped up the bathroom lining of the bathroom that our family had used. I even purposely chipped away at the paint in the wall and showed the blackened paint chips that the mold had proliferated in. And I stated very specifically, this is the mold that we have been complaining to you folks about for months on end. I asked that you notify your facilities manager, Tom Rodriguez, to have this addressed as soon as possible. Following that, my family and I had, or not my family, my, myself and my chain of command, we all had a discussion with Balfour Beatty as far as how can we come to a compromise. There is no compromise. Essentially, we need to get out of the home. 
we were seeking, we being my family and I, to either have our move funded by Balfour Beatty, and if not them, at least Steve Ford Gordon Garrison. Both channels denied our request to fund our move, which at that point we had to move off post. So while I am dealing with the Balfour Beatty representatives, as well as the Garrison representatives, to include the Garrison command team, to include the housing manager at that time, Jenna Holman, my wife is seven months pregnant and is moving things on her own because none of these organizations will pay for our off-post move. So I'm not lacking as far as financials, but at the same time, it's the principle behind it. If our home is a source of my daughter's condition and we have been told succinctly that we need to move off-post, by all means, we will move off-post. But the principle behind it is Balfour Bay should have at least provided some type of support or the garrison should have some part of So finally, at, at, with great effort, engaging the uh, garrison command, making repeated requests, you managed to get out of the home. You send an email to Paula Cook documenting your experience. You read a portion from that. Yes. Did you receive a, an apology from Ms. Cook in response to that email? I have never received an apology from Balfour Beatty or any of the representatives at any point in time. Up in the- fact, did you receive a collection notice? That is correct. I received- did they threaten to send a collection agency against you? To add insult to injury, Yes. And when you challenged that, were you informed that it had been a mistake? Yes, which I challenged that reasoning by saying, well, there was a considerable thought behind a collection's notice being purposely sent to me stating the charges that were notated on the collection itself. If this was an internal error, this should have been caught prior to distribution to my home. Thank you, Captain Cho. Senator Langford's arrived with just one minute remaining. Sergeant Torres, I want to make sure we dig in on one specific aspect of your case. So your wife suffers from respiratory condition, correct? And you have repeatedly asked Balfour to remediate the mold in your home. You're initially told those, there's no issue. Finally, you, you place urgent requests. They send uh, an inspection company to inspect the home, correct? Correct. The inspection company finds that there's 175 square feet of uh, area in your home that need to be remediated or replaced, correct? Correct. But at the same time, Balfour has hired a third-party company called Exponent that never looked at the home, which and they attach exponents report to this mold inspection report telling you it's actually no big deal and remediating the mold is premature. Is that correct? Correct. But they go ahead and they remediate the mold. And here's the point that I think is important, and I'm going to ask that my team uh, prepare to show slide four. You place these work orders upon returning to your home, and you reported mold, correct? That is correct. Those are your work orders. You describe mold on the floor behind hall bathroom and mold under the mech room. Is that correct? That is correct. All right, well, now I'm going to ask that slide five be depicted. Here at the bottom, we have the internal data from Balfour's Yardi system, which they use to maintain work orders, and they've classified your requests as carpentry. So you've placed two work orders for mold in the home. Those are filed internally as carpentry. You can close the slide. I want to ask you, Ms. Christian, what are we looking at there? Um, what you're looking at is what you'll see across the board at all of the Balfour Beatty installations. They are taking what is a hazard in a home and making it a simplified request so that when the seven-year maintenance history or when any of the um, information is provided to the next tenant, it's not going to be correct. Um, Also, it's way easier to close out a carpentry request than it is to provide a full-scale mold remediation. We'll get into that more with Balfour's representatives later. Thank you, Ms. Christian. I now yield seven minutes to Senator Lankford. Thank you. Y'all, thanks for being here. I have a good feeling that none of you really want to be able to be here to have to walk through all this uh, and the frustration of it. Uh, So thanks for being here and for speaking out and for representing the voice of a lot of other folks uh, through this process. Uh, I really do appreciate that. Mr. Christensen, I want to ask you a question that's been asked before on this, and I want to be able to do some follow-up on it. It is when the command leadership was taken out of the equation, they lost an advocate. The plan was there'd be other advocates that are there, but it's our understanding those advocates are not able to be able to articulate that. Why? Why aren't they able to articulate the issues and get results? So the, this varies from branch of service, um, the type of advocate you have in the installation and, and across the board, but I will say that none of them 
um, that we've come into contact with, which is a majority of military installations in the country, um, have training in housing. Um, so they are not equipped to understand what an inspection should look like. Um, for example, I'll give you an, in North Carolina. Um, there are certifications for home inspection, but the person who is supposed to be your advocate um, is going to walk through your home and tell you whether or not something is awry in your home. And I have seen them miss gas leaks. Um, I've seen them miss um, molds. I've seen them miss lead chipping. And they walk through a lot of the times with the housing company themselves. Um, and they lean on, um, in this case, they lean on Balfour Beatty's um, as assistance to understand what's actually going on in the home because they are not trained. Okay, so what's the solution to that? Are you, you you're suggesting some sort of state certification before they can do that? Some sort of federal certification for that? Absolutely, so, an yeah. industry standard. So they need to follow state laws. Um, so someone who would be providing the same type of inspection um, at a other facility off of the installation, they need to be trained in understanding um, the state law, the fire codes, um, anything that you would need if you were to inspect a, an, an a home off the installation. Would you put that person under the authority of your commanders at that point to be able to have, again, where you've got somebody that they answer to for it, or who do they work for? Personally, I would hope that we would have a, a true third party outside of the partnership, because this is not just a contractor. These are partnerships between the branch of service and the housing companies. So if you do, if you do report directly to them, they have an incentive um, to have their partnership functioning. They don't want that to fall. So it needs to be a true third party outside of that. Okay. So Balfour, uh, in my state, uh, Tucker Air Force Base, the largest of the sustainment uh, facilities in the country, uh, and then Altus Air Force Base. Uh, Altus was put into a grouping of multiple different entities, uh, of which Tyndall was one of those. Uh, so with Tyndall being in that mix, and obviously Tyndall getting obliterated in a hurricane, all the focus seems to be going there. And uh, there'll be lots of new construction in Tyndall, but because of that, and they're in a grouping of four, then they're not going to get the attention from Balfour at Altus. So Altus is suffering the consequences of a hurricane on the other side, literally, of the country uh, of that because of the grouping that they're in. The, re the local folks of what mm -hmm. I hear when I talk to individuals on base uh, or when we talk to leadership on it, they are very pleased with the turnaround that Balfour has had the last couple of years because in 2018, Balfour Tinker Air Force Base, all the mold, all the issues, non-responsive. At Altus, we still continue to be able to get Band-Aid fixes for things that should be replaced or actually just constant Band-Aid fixes where they know that's going to work for a few months and I'm going to be calling you again. So it's two big issues that are here. One is trying to be able to balance out how where there's a hurricane in one area so every other base actually gets punished because of that, because all their focus is going to be somewhere else, or how do you deal with the issue of Band-Aid fixes uh, that actually get actually repaired so this isn't a nuisance for those families? you have ideas on either of those? If, if you don't provide a Band-Aid fix and you provide the correct fix the first time, then you're not incurring the cost of right. continually going out and trying to Band-Aid fix these problems. No, I get that totally. Who becomes the advocate to actually make sure it's not a Band-Aid fix, uh, that this is actually something that gets actually repaired or replaced rather than just a patch on it? So somebody's got to be in that chain of command, obviously, or that somewhere there's got to be accountability for the resident to be able to say, I know that's not going to work. Everybody else knows that's not going to work. But they're saying, I fixed it and wrote it up and turned it in. I believe that was the intent of having the government housing office um, on the installations um, to, to do that. But they, residents absolutely need an oversight tool that they can report directly to outside of the installation and outside of those employees. Okay. Uh, I'm running out of time on this. I want to be able to honor time. Mr. Shores, I, I want to be able to ask you this as well. Excuse me. Let me just go ahead and call you by your title, by tech sergeant. Yes, sir. Um, thanks, by the way. Let me go ahead and ask you on this. You've, you've lived in other places that weren't under Balfour. Correct. What was it like? Compare it. Uh, it was actually, I, we never had any issues. I, I've been stationed two other places uh, and never had, once had any issues, um, especially where they know my background, they know what I do, um, that they've always, hey, we put a work order in. I will be there right away. They come out, fix it, never had any issues. My family never had any problems. Uh, 
I can be at work and I could be, you know, I've deployed twice, uh, three times, and I've never had to be worried. Mm. Uh, I'm an instructor and every time we put a work order in, I'm having to be at the house because my wife is scared that, you know, they're going to kind of blow her off because, you know, they don't want to talk to the spouse. They just want to talk to the military person and just because that if I say something wrong, they can just go ahead and tell my leadership and then I get in trouble for it when it shouldn't be that way. You know, my wife is a stay at home mom and she should be able to call a work order in and they help her out and as much as they can, not for me having to be there because my wife's scared of being there with a the technician. Yeah, totally get that. You should be respectful of that. By the way, she's a resident at the house as well, correct? Correct. Yeah, so why would it matter which resident of the house is actually calling that in? Kevin Clough, same issue. You've lived in other places, uh, not with Balfour as, a, as the uh, caretaker for the home. Can you compare the two? My family, my father in particular, has told me quite clearly, um, if you have the opportunity or the choice to reside on post or off post, always choose off post. Uh, I had asked that before when I was younger and up until my military service commenced, and he gave me very sound reasoning. Unfortunately, uh, this is the only time that we lived on post at an installation, and this will be the very last time that we live on post at any installation. Yeah. Shouldn't be that way, and it's one of the issues that we face uh, at Altus Air Force Base is that it's older housing that needs to be redone completely, but now we're on the bottom of the list. Uh, because Tyndall is going to end up with all new, and they're just going to say that's going to get all new, and Altus and the other three bases that are in that group are just going to continue to be old and old and older, uh, which doesn't meet what our folks need, actually, on that particular base. So thank you all uh, for being here very much and for your service to the country. Thank you, Senator Langford. Ranking Member Johnson. Hey, Mr. Chairman, I, th I think part of the problem here is the housing that these contracting companies have taken over is extremely old, Correct. You know, Ms. Christensen or, or not? No, I don't believe that's the case. Um, there are some that are older and they have different issues like lead and asbestos. Um, but you can look at brand new um, homes and they are going to have the same systemic issues that um, other, other homes have, especially with the way that they're constructed. Um, there's going to be leaks coming in. But no matter what, if you fix a leak, it will not cause problems if you remediate it correctly the first time. So no matter if they're new homes or old homes, failed maintenance is failed maintenance, and okay. it's going to continue to occur. So it sounds like uh, Senator Carper, I don't want to put words in his mouth, but apparently at Dover's Air Force Base, he believes the uh, base commander is taking charge of this and is doing a pretty good job. I mean, it's never perfect. Uh, are there some bases, are there some uh, housing units that are in better shape than others where you don't have the kind of complaints? I mean, are there, are there some real problem areas? Uh, there's definitely larger problem areas, um, and there's also installations that are having a better time um, with certain certain things. Like, I can find you an installation that has better mold than others. Um, you're still going to find mold there, even in the desert. Um, so you're you're going to see it across the board. I wouldn't say that anybody is um, doing it a better way that I can bring to you? I would love to. I would love to say model everything after this installation because then our organization wouldn't have to exist. Um, we're a 100% volunteer run organization that's handling a massive, a massive amount of clientele. But you, you gave two examples of what the uh, supposed fix in the NDA from a couple of years ago uh, resulted in, took leases from 10 pages to 100 and took it to a 48 step resolution process or? Correct. Any, any, other, any other bureaucratic fixes like that? Um, there's a ton. Um, so, I mean, those are two really great examples that you can visually see, but just the process in which you need to um, request any type of assistance is so lengthy that most families are giving up and their homes are going to continue to deteriorate. So, so I'm the bean counter on this committee. Um, so I kind of want to do ask a couple bean counter questions because I haven't got the overall extent of this. I mean, to, to my knowledge, what I saw... It looks like uh, Balfour B is paid uh, roughly around $30 million a year for its housing management. Is that accurate? I have no idea of any of those numbers. Um, I would love to know what they are, <laughs> but no, I, that's not something accessible to me. Okay, so you wouldn't be able to tell me how, what is the total uh, government contract amounts for managing this housing? 
No, and um, I will tell you that we have tried to get a lot of that information through Freedom of Information Act requests, um, but it's, it's claimed as proprietary, so we get a lot of uh, blacked out documents. I uh, run the same problem when I try and do legitimate oversight, uh, so I, f I feel your pain on that. Uh, you did mention, uh, this was a comment, that this is profits over people. Uh, do you know what the profitability level is? Um, I don't know what the profitability is, um, but I will tell you that it has to be good enough because they keep coming back to the Senate to hear it, and they haven't tried to get away with anything else. Okay, well, I'll obviously be exploring that with the the folks here from Balfour. Uh, one of the reasons I asked the question is, if, if, if my information is correct and Balfour is getting about $30 million a year, they paid a $65 million fine, um, I'd, I'd kind of scratch my head and go, why, why even be in that business? How many other contractors like Balfour are there? There are 14 housing. 14, how, how many, generally you've got an 80-20 rule. 80% uh, of the work is done by about 20%. Are there, are there a top five or so? Yes, there's um, Balfour Beatty, Liberty Military Housing, Corvius, Hunt, um, and for some reason I can't think of a... Do you, does your group find any difference in terms of the level of management of any of those companies? I mean, are there some companies that are just heads and tails above the others? No. I mean, if you took Balfour Beatty out of any of the statements that any, anybody at this table wrote, you can interchange them with any of the other companies. And I will say that the smaller companies who have not gotten the attention um, that the other ones have are absolutely horrific for residents to live in. They are the worst. So, so you know, if, if I'm a base commander and I had the power to, you know, use the free market system and say, you're not performing, I'm going to fire you, I'm going to hire somebody else. It doesn't seem like there's anybody else to hire that would do a better job. I don't agree with that necessarily. I think that the fact that there is not that ability is the reason that this is occurring. Well, I understand. No, I'm, but again, right now there is not that ability, correct? That, that's, that's the point I'm trying to make. So I'm, I'm trying to drill down on what is the root cause of this? Uh, wh why does this continue? Again, in, in, a, in a free market, there should be, and I come from the, from the you know, free market system, I compete against excellence. And excellence means really high quality, high levels of customer service at the best po possible price. I mean, that's what a free market guarantee. Something's broken down here, okay? And my guess uh, is bureaucratic fixes that just simply don't work. You know, bureaucratic mindset, uh, it's not my problem. We're going to pass this bill and we're going to say we're going to turn it over here, kind of walk away. And the bureaucracy creates fixes like, you know, a 100-page lease, a 48-step resolution process, you know, finger-pointing, uh, the big runaround, and nothing gets fixed. So I I'm trying to hone in, hone in on what is the root cause here and how can it actually be fixed. My guess is, you know, I'd be looking for a free market solution, and I'd fire these people, okay? But you've got to have somebody to replace it. And I'm, that's one of the reasons I'm talking about profitability. I mean, is, is there enough incentive for good companies to come in here and do the kind of job that we would all expect? And again, I, I recognize you can't really answer that question. I would, but I would hope that there is, but I would also like to say, that, like you're saying, like you're, you're competing in a market um, off the installation. You're competing in a market where I am paying rent to you, and if you're not doing a good job, you don't receive my rent. Um, that's not the case for these housing companies. They're still, and that was something that three years ago they requested was for service members to not be able to just have that allotted. And that's a big oversight. Lack it, it also sounds like there's relationships between people on the base, members of the military, and people working for these companies. Is that, is that a common problem? or Absolutely. Uh, that is an absolute problem because if you're going to someone and you have a personal relationship with them, they're not going to want to get them in trouble. So again, I have no doubt that Armed Services Committee tried to fix this a couple of years ago. I think uh, the, the result of our investigation, the result of this hearing is didn't work. We better figure out something better to do. But anyway, I appreciate your testimony, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Ranking Member Johnson. This concludes the testimony from our first panel. I want to thank you all so sincerely for your presence, uh, for sharing your experiences and information with us. In particular, want to commend these two extraordinary active duty service members, uh, one of whom flew from South Korea, one from Texas, to join us uh, and uh, get on the record your experiences uh, and with gratitude 
This panel is dismissed, and uh, we'll now prepare to hear from our second panel. Thank you. We will now call our second panel of witnesses for this morning's hearing. Mr. Richard Taylor is the President of Facility Operations, Renovations, and Construction at Balfour Beatty Communities with overall responsibility for Balfour's military housing facility management activities, including preventative maintenance, repairs, and quality assurance. He has worked for the firm and its predecessors for 19 years and worked in the industry for nearly three decades. He also previously served in the U.S. Navy for more than 12 years. Ms. Paula Cook just transitioned to Vice President for Transformation at Balfour, responsible for leading the company's, quote, new culture shaping initiatives. Up until last week, she served as Vice President of Community Management in charge of Balfour's Army portfolio of military housing properties, and she has been with the company since 2007. Ms. Cook is also a U.S. Navy veteran. I appreciate both of you for joining us today. We look forward to your testimony. It's the custom of this subcommittee to swear in all witnesses, so at this time I would ask you to please stand and raise your right hand. Do you swear the testimony you will give before this subcommittee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? Let the record reflect that the witnesses answered in the affirmative. We will be using a timing system today. Ms. Cook and Mr. Taylor, you submitted joint written testimony, and it will be printed in the record in its entirety. I understand that Mr. Taylor will provide oral testimony on behalf of both witnesses. Mr. Taylor, please kindly limit your remarks to five minutes. You may proceed. safety, health, and well-being of the service members and their families across the 55 military installations we serve, including Fort Gordon, Fort Stewart, and Shepherd Air Force Base. I am accompanied by Paul... Forgive me, Mr. Taylor. Would you just ensure your microphone is active? Is that better? That is. Thank you. Would you mind uh, beginning at the beginning? Not at all. Thank you. Chairman Ossoff, Ranking Member Johnson, members of the subcommittee. Thank you for the opportunity to provide an update on the commitment of Balfour Beatty communities to support the safety, health, and well-being of the service members and their families across the 55 military installations we serve, including Fort Gordon, Fort Stewart, and Shepherd Air Force Base. I'm accompanied by Paula Cook, who leads the ongoing transformation efforts for our community management operations. At BBC, we consider it an honor and a privilege to serve those who serve our country. In fact, both Paula and I are Navy veterans ourselves, Therefore, we have a special appreciation for our military housing rules at Balfour Beatty. In 2019, I made a commitment at, in congressional testimony to improve BBC's ability to monitor repairs and respond to problems, to prioritize the health and safety of residents, and to prepare homes for residents before they move into one of our homes. I'm proud to say that we have made enormous strides since I made that commitment. Today, we're responsible for housing operations encompassing more than 43,000 homes and approximately 150,000 residents. We have partnered with the DOD to oversee the construction of more than 15,000 new military homes and the renovation of more than 14,000 legacy homes. Since the start of the MHPI, BBC and our service branch partners have developed project investments totaling approximately $5.6 billion to improve on-base housing. Through our military housing agreements, we act in joint partnership 
and are required to coordinate with all of our DOD partners on all aspects of the leasing, maintenance, renovation, and development of our housing. Our primary focus is providing our residents with safe, quality homes supported by prompt and effective customer service and maintenance support. We look to support these efforts by maintaining robust, open communications with our residents. Our resident portals allow the residents to view their work order history as well as access community policies, household maintenance, and safety tips. In addition, our new national call center is staffed and available 24-7 to initiate a work order, schedule maintenance, and provide updates. I want to emphasize that we are committed to maintaining accurate work order data. We do not tolerate anyone at BBC falsifying work order information. Both BBC and the government's local military housing offices have multiple checkpoints with new residents before, during, and after move-in to identify issues or questions regarding the home. We supplement this personal outreach with our own resident surveys. These surveys are conducted by an independent third party and are sent to residents after move-in and after responding to a work order. Like with any customer service business, we recognize that unfortunately, we will never be able to make every resident happy. But nevertheless, we remain resolute in that pursuit. In 2021, we received just over 40,000 survey responses, resulting in an average service score of 4.53 out of five. For the period January 1st of 2021 through last week, the average work order score at Fort Gordon in particular was 4.62. With over a third of our military housing stock consisting of aging units constructed by the military, we will never have homes that present zero maintenance issues. On average, we receive and process more than 280,000 resident-generated work orders annually. Like with any residential housing property, there will always be challenges to face. Appliances will break, utility plumbing and electrical systems will fail, severe weather will cause damage, pest issues will arise, and customer service complaints will surface. I also want to emphasize that our teams have faced tremendous challenges since the pandemic hit in 2020. We are not alone in experiencing supply chain challenges, home access issues, staffing issues due to the pandemic. However, our obligation is to respond and manage repairs and service in as timely and effective a manner as possible. We have embraced and voluntarily implemented the following measures in support of our residents. We agreed to a new DOD-sponsored universal lease, which includes the Tenant Bill of Rights. We instituted a formal dispute resolution process, and we now provide seven-year maintenance histories for our homes. In addition, enhanced DOD monitoring of, of housing has created another check and balance to ensure our housing is safe for occupancy, such as through government housing inspections before any home may be offered. Our performance metrics indicate the overwhelming majority of our residents are happy with their home and the service we provide. Regardless, we are never satisfied where even a small, number, small numbers of our residents report dissatisfaction. We remain dedicated to working with the residents, our military, the military housing advocacy groups, and the DOD to address housing challenges. We look forward to learning from the subcommittee how we may further improve our performance and enhance the quality of life for our residents. Again, we appreciate, we appreciate the opportunity to continue serving our nation's military and to testify regarding our commitment to those efforts. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Taylor and, and Ms. Cook. And Ms. Cook, I understand Mr. Taylor is offering those oral remarks on uh, both of your behalfs. Uh, I'll begin now with, with my questions. Uh, in the course of this investigation, my and Ranking Member Johnson's teams and we have reviewed tens of thousands of pages of records, interviewed dozens of witnesses. Most of that investigation focused on 2019, 2020, 2021, or the period principally after Balfour's guilty plea. In order to understand which forms of misconduct or mismanagement may be persisting following that resolution of the Department of Justice. But before we get into that, I want to just, Mr. Taylor, make sure we're clear on the facts related to that Department of Justice matter. It is the case, is it not, and my time's limited, so I want to make sure that we cover this as concisely as we can, that from 2013 to 2019, your company engaged in a scheme to defraud the United States, correct? The, the record indicate, or the, the is that correct that you engage in a scheme to defraud the United States, that, Senator? The settlement agreement acknowledges that, yes, sir. Okay, so from 2013 to 2019, your company engaged in a scheme to defraud the United States. I suppose the first question is, why should a company convicted of major criminal fraud 
that engaged in a scheme to defraud the United States remain in a position of trust responsible for the safe housing of the hero service members and their families on installations across the country? I'd like to answer that by putting it a little bit into context. As, as you indicated, Senator, the period in, in which the, the uh, uh, behavior took place was from the period 2013 to 2019. When we were alerted uh, to the uh, ac allegations that there was improper behavior amongst some of our employees, we immediately uh, cooperated along the way with the DOJ investigators. We engaged our own uh, third-party uh, legal firm and forensic uh, accountants to understand the, the root causes. We provided all of that information uh, in collaboration with the DOJ as, as that investigation was, was ongoing. We did a quick, uh, we did an analysis to understand what the root causes were. We didn't wait for the, the outcome of that investigation and the settlement that was reached in late of last year to act upon the things that we identified were shortcomings within our own business. So we took quick, quick action to... to and, and we're going to get, Mr. Change. Taylor, forgive me, but my time is limited. We're going to get into the actions that you've taken and whether or not those actions have had good effect. Let's talk about what constituted this six-year scheme to defraud the United States to which Balfour pled guilty. Am I correct that this scheme to defraud the United States included the falsification and destruction of work order records? Yes or no? It did. Am I correct that this scheme to defraud the United States included lying to the armed services? Yes or no? L lying, not, well, you, you say lying. We put forward... Well, I'm sorry, I've got here, this is paragraph 24 of a statement of facts. Balfour Beatty made false representations to all three service branches. We, we put forward false uh, incentive fee submissions that didn't reflect um, the, the performance metrics at, at certain locations. A am I correct that this scheme to defraud the United States, which included the falsification and destruction of maintenance record, also included prematurely closing work orders in order to present to the military superior performance to what was happening in reality in order to secure incentive payments. That's, that's a fair statement, yes, sir. And it is your position, Mr. Taylor, that despite engaging in this six-year scheme to defraud the United States, major criminal fraud, that your company should remain in a position of trust housing America's military families, yes or no? Yes, yes, I do. That is your position. Okay, I want to, for a moment, please, Ms. Cook, and we'll return to some of the latest events, uh, Mr. Taylor, but ask you, Ms. Cook, about your experience in your position. And I want to begin by asking you to review for the subcommittee correspondence that you received from service members who were housed at Fort Gordon after the period during which Balfour was engaged in a scheme to defraud the United States, the period during which Balfour assured the Department of Justice, the Department of Defense, and the U.S. Congress that it was improving its practices. If you would, Ms. Cook, please turn to tab 10. You'll see at the bottom, uh, Ms. Cook, customer comments this is an email that you received from a tenant in your housing. The email is dated September of 2020. Would you please read, beginning with customer comments, and on to the next page? It's not a long email. Yes, uh, I recently retired after 21 years of combined service. This is by far the worst housing I have ever lived in. We had mold in our house, under the vinyl floors, in the walls, behind our cabinets, and in the vents. Our roof leaked, and the sheetrock fell in the closet. I was in the MEB process, and the sewer line collapsed, and we had to move. They gave me one week to vacate a house that was not fit for occupancy so they could work on it. I was forced to move from one house to another. While physically disabled, then in the six months that we remained there, they did no work on the house. The company is unprofessional and should be removed from the installation. They have no clue what it means to run a safe and organized military housing community. 
Uh, the installation leadership needs to do a walkthrough of housing and talk to every resident. Uh, I know of several people that have multiple issues with their homes and nothing seems to be getting accomplished. Since I'm no longer in the military, I do not fear re retaliation from the housing office. If I had to do it all over again, I would not live on base and would have found a home that was better suited for my family. Customer has requested a response from management. Thank you, Ms. Cook. And, and this is one of many emails that you received that we reviewed. Here are some quotes from others. Urine stains were found in three of the four bedrooms. Bathroom floorboards were forming bubbles with water in them. Mold was growing on carpet. We risk health issues for my 19-month-old baby. Death trap of a house. I have a pregnant wife who is high risk and I have to live with this. Exposed mold on my ceiling. We continuously get provided little to no response. Water leaks into kitchen light cover. Nothing has been done. That's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven emails that you received all after the period during which Balfour was engaged in a scheme to defraud the United States. I, I want to ask you, Mr. Taylor, given that your company engaged in major criminal fraud, why should we believe your assurances? We've heard from Captain Cho. We've heard from Sergeant Torres. They've both told us their horror stories. We've heard from advocates who have described these issues as systemic and ongoing. We just went through... 12 or 13 emails Ms. Cook received. My office interviewed dozens of others who reported significant issues with, with work orders being misclassified, ongoing concerns about contamination, ceilings falling in. Why should we believe, Mr. Taylor, that a company that engaged in major fraud against the United States is fixing this? Well, first off, Senator, I, I reject the suggestion that it's a systemic failure. You, you cited, in the, in the case that you, you just read, 12 emails, 11 emails, as I shared with you, we're accompanying the process is 280,000 on average emails annually. Things go wrong. We don't always get it right the first time. We're not perfect. We've never testified that, that we are a perfect organization that gets, gets it right 100% the first time. What's important for us is that we understand where our shortcomings are and we take action to correct those deficiencies. Mr. Taylor, my, my, my time is, is limited. My question is very specific. It's why should we believe your assurances when your company engaged in a six-year-long scheme to defraud the United States? Why should we believe your assurances? That is my question. Take a look at the, the actions that we've taken subsequent to that, that period in, in time. We've shared that, that information with, with your staff during interviews, some of the, that information. We've shared that information. We've been very transparent with... Uh, the services, service branches, OSD, we've been transparent with the, the HASC and SAS staffers on, on the journey that we've been on to transform our business. And the re results that we're seeing are demonstrating that we are taking this very, have taken this very seriously, and we're taking very proactive steps to ensure that, that we don't repeat the mistakes of, of, of the, the individuals in our, in our firm that, that worked here at the time that there was, there was Thank you, Mr. Taylor. We will, we will get into uh, some of those specific steps you've taken in a moment. My time has expired. I yield to Ranking Member Johnson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Taylor, I, I just want to find out a little bit more about Balfour. You're, you're, you're a division of Balfour Beatty PLC, correct? That's correct. H headquartered out of London? That's correct. Uh, a little more than eight billion pound business? I, I believe that's so how, how big a division is yours? Uh, in terms of that, that, that volume of business, uh, our business is, is we're, we're part of an investments division. The, the, the value that, that is uh, promulgated um, by, the, by the company is largely around our construction and services business. The investments business does not comprise part of that revenue, if you will. Revenue is looked at differently in the construction-related business than it is in our investments business, to include our, our, our military housing, which is a subsidiary. So are you, are, you, are you associated with the construction part of your division, or si simply the facility management? We, we, so there is Balfour Beatty uh, Investments is a, is a division of Balfour Beatty PLC. Balfour Beatty Communities is a subsidiary of Balfour Beatty Investments. So it's, it's a, a third-tier organization within, within the structure, if you will, that is, exists to provide housing to our service members and their families, and, and we do other uh, apartment-type communities, student housing around the country, under that banner of, of Balfour Beatty Communities. So Ms. Christensen, uh, or Ms. Christian, talked about that this is 
profit over people, pure and simple. Um, do you have a response to that? I, I absolutely have a response to that. I, I, I think that that is an unfair characterization. We work tirelessly. We've got approximately 1,400 employees that, that work up, about a third of whom, by the way, are like Ms. Cook and myself, former military retirees. We employ a number of spouses that also uh, choose to live with us. We have folks that get up every day with, with a single, singular commitment to provide for the, the health and safety of, of our military residents. So I think that that's an unfair characterization. Again, I'll go back to, do our people make mistakes? Yes, they make mistakes. There's human error in every business. But, but the suggestion that the, the error rate where is, is indicative of widespread um, broken business is, is, is totally unfair. So in my brief materials, I, I saw something like $30 million a year generated for this division. To me, that seemed just woefully low. Is that an accurate number, or is there a different number? Well, it's, it's, the, it's uh, the deal that we struck when we, when we closed on the projects. That $30 million, roughly, is, is, is about the average over the last three years for the receipt of the property management fees across our 55 military installations, 43,000 housing units. To put it into co context, that equates to about $700 per unit per year on a pre-tax basis. And it doesn't net off the, the, the cost of running the business. But, that, that's, but that, that is a, just a small percentage of your division, correct? N no, sir. That is, that is your division. That is, that is the most significant revenue stream for our okay, so you have So $30 million. So when you pay a $65 million fine, that wipes out more than two years' worth of revenue. It's not just profit, but revenue. And that, that $30 million a year division, that employs 1,400 people? Approximately 1,400, yes, sir. Do you, do you also subcontract out to... Uh, Contractors, we do. do you, so, 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 what percent do you perform with those fourteen hundred people versus? Uh, again, that's that's fourteen hundred people looking at about forty three thousand units. Yes, sir. Yeah, there, there's a lot of third party support, and it, and it varies jurisdictionally. You know, if if we're in a market where um, there's um, limited availability of third party vendors, then we'll have a heavier staff than than we would. Um, but generally speaking, we could have anywhere from 10 to 12 vendors uh, on a third-party service agreement that assists us with, with the performance of our work. Do you, uh, do you evaluate your vendors? I mean, do you, if they don't perform, do you terminate their contracts and hire others? Absolutely. How, how often do you do that? There, we have uh, the standard termination clauses that are in contracts that you find in any contracting arrangement. So, again, you manage 43,000 housing units. How many, what is the total inventory of housing units for the military? Do you know? I think it's about 300,000, might be a little under, 280,000. OSD can give you that. So you're, you're more than 10%? Yes, sir. Are, are you the largest manager of, of housing units, or are there other people that are as big or larger? I, I believe there's one provider that, has, that manages more units than we do. Okay. Um, how do you explain the testimony you hear, heard from uh, uh, Captain Cho, uh, Sergeant Torres, Ms. Wanner. Um, I think it's, uh, it's their perception of, of what transpired. I think that uh, we've got uh, a different perception. Um, I think that... Um, well, can, can, you, can you give us a, a different pers perspective, for example, with the, uh, Captain Cho's daughter? Well, first, I mean... You know, as a, as a father of a son and daughter myself, I, I have empathy, you know, substantial empathy for, for the Cho family. Um, I know that's not hard to deal with, with any animal, with any, any child. I have a hard time drawing a conclusion, the, the conclusion that's been drawn on the, on the first panel that there's, there's a, a direct correlation between the condition of the, of the home and, and his daughter's medical condition. Okay, I guess, you know, that's, that's a leg legitimate point to make. Um, sometimes very difficult to prove causation on things, but uh, do you deny the fact that uh, the issues of mold just weren't addressed over a relatively long period of time? I do deny that, yes, yes, sir. And, and, and when I, in advance of this, having known uh, that Captain Cho was going to testify, again, I, I wasn't involved in, in the details, but I, I, I took time to kind of understand a, a bit more about, about the, the situation because I wanted to be responsive to, to the subcommittee. Um, in, in the time that, that uh, the Cho family lived with us, they submitted 28 work orders. Um, 
22 of which were online, and, and Captain Cho acknowledged that that was, you know, he used that predominantly to, to let us know that work was being requested. The one work order that was uh, put in in late February of 2020 was inspected twice by our staff, was jointly inspected by our military housing partner, and found no evidence of mold at that time. Subsequent to that, there were 11 additional uh, work orders that were, that were put in online by, by Captain Cho, clearly indicating you know, his, his uh, intent to continue to notify us uh, through uh, the online portal to, to notify us of, of those issues. And, and I think, importantly for me, I think it's you know, clear demonstration that, that Captain Cho had, had access to the portal, which also doesn't give him just the, the, the ability to input work orders, but it gives you, you can see any open work orders and what the status is of those work orders. Um, so I guess my, my perspective, ha having heard what I heard a little bit ago, is um, if he didn't think that we were responding to the work orders, by engaging in the resident portal, it should have been clear that, that no work order was, was being looked at in our, in our system. To my knowledge, we, we've not been notified of that. To my knowledge, we've never seen any um, photographic evidence of any, other, any mold uh, existing with the home. To my knowledge, the, um, the medical um, doctor's letter that, that suggested that the home might be the, the cause of, of uh, uh, her skin conditions and or the, the school, uh, to my knowledge, that, that doctor never visited the home personally to, to view the condition in the home. To my knowledge, that report, that report was written, that letter was written in late June of 2020 and was provided to our site team in October of that year, about a four-month delay. So when I, when I kind of look at the, the fact pattern, I, I think that there's just holes. Um, and, and, and so I think that, you know, it's hard for me to, to reconcile in my mind that, that the home was, was, was actually the, the cause of, of the condition when um, the findings that we had in responding to the work request didn't indicate the same. Mr. Chairman, would you give me time to see what, uh, how Ms. Cook responds to that? S same question, Ms. Cook. Do you have any explanation? Could you, could you repeat the explanation on the mold? Is that what you're... Well, just in, in terms of the situation with the... Captain Cho and his daughter. Yeah. Uh, it's, you, know, it, you, you, you listen to their testimony. I mean, do you just refute it? I, it's heartbreaking. I am a grandmother. I'm a mother. I care deeply about our residents, as, as all of our team does. I will say that we did go inspect that home. I personally did not, but our team is trained, as well as our garrison housing office is trained, and I do feel that if there was a life health safety issue that we would have immediately removed that family so that we could remediate. Okay. There was no signs of life health safety. If it's behind the walls, I cannot see that, no, sir, but I do feel that we did follow all EPA and CDC guidelines in that home as well as all of our homes. Okay, well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Scott. Sure. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Ranking Member. Uh, thank you for being here. So I was Governor of Florida. I, I served the Navy, and um, I did at that time there there was no public ha any, any housing for us. But um, but the I think it's I mean I think well acknowledged. We've got to do whatever we can to provide our men and women the best uh, facilities, the best care we can. Um, so I want to sort of follow up with Senator Johnson was talking about. But first, I want to just ask something specific. Um, and by the, by the way, I did, when I was governor, I did base commander meetings about every four months and just try to solve, find their problems. And because uh, it was a federal issue, I never dealt with that. But since I've been in the Senate, I've been up here a little over three years. A lot of people have complained. So I just want to go through one specific one. So I've received reports of unacceptable housing conditions in the, um, at the Naval Air Station Key West. I don't know if you're familiar with this. It's the Sigsby Park Annex. Um, it says most of the units require significant improvements so that enlisted personnel and their families can have safe housing. 
So do you know what efforts have been made to ensure that our service members in Key West are living in acceptable housing conditions and what your plans are to improve them? Is that something you, you're familiar with or not? I am, Senator. As, as a matter of fact, I think it was approximately two weeks ago I was at Key West visiting with, with uh, our team on that site. Um, I think you're well aware, you know, Key West has the majority, overwhelming majority of what we have there is, is legacy housing. Um, we constructed 111 new units during the initial development period. That project is part of an 11 base multi-site project called the Navy Southeast Project. Um, we've, uh, we've invested heavily in, in uh, you know, renovation of, of Sigsby in, in particular. We've done bump outs, we've done uh, kitchen improvements, we've done you know, a lot of significant changes in there. We haven't been able to touch them all because of the financial constraints, I can tell you. We've had some issues with uh, HVAC, um, you know, duct sweating just because of the conditions in those homes. Um, we've had some issues be, um, with lack of, of quality insulation because of the, the, the time in which those units were, were constructed that are being addressed through this renovation plan. Um, the Navy Southeast project in, in particular, you know, is, is financially stressed. Um, the BH increases haven't materialized over the time period that, that were expected. Um, insurance and, and, uh, and utility rates have, have far outpaced, you know, rates of inflation. I'll give you an example for, for all of the Navy Southeast project. Um, this year, after we set our budgets, I think it was in March of this year, March or it might have been April, um, the local utility or the utility that manages um, or provides the utilities for uh, Key West and all the Navy Southeast told us that there's going to be a 30% increase in utility costs this year when we budgeted for three. So those are the sorts of things that, those are the sorts of challenges that I think don't get talked about enough in this type of forum because those are the real challenges that, that we ought to be engaging in. Do, again, I'll go back. Do we, do we make mistakes occasionally? Yes. But, but if we want to look out for the long-term health and viability of, the, of this program that can serve the, the needs and interests of our, our service members and their families, we ought to be having the conversation about the financial viability of the projects. Okay, can we go through, and it's, it's similar to Johnson's um, question. So how long have you been at the company? 22 years, sir. Okay. So did you do the contract? Uh, did, did, you, did you enter into the contract? I was, uh, I led the business development team that, that pursued and pursued that project. For the economics. So, so how's it work? So you get, you get, are you getting paid uh, a fee per home? Are you getting paid, are you, did you pay for uh, all the existing housing and then you're responsible for it? How's it work? Yeah, so in this case with, with the Navy projects, very similar to the Army projects, um, the, the private partners, in this case, I'll talk about our company. We made an equity uh, contribution, an equity investment in the project. That equity investment, typically for most projects, I don't recall specifically for Navy Southeast, generally between 1 and 5%. The Navy always wanted less equity in, in the projects than the other branches. The Navy would make an invest, a, a financial investment uh, that they took out of their near appropriations. And then, the, and then what we would do is we would underwrite the potential revenue from the basic allowance for housing that we see, receive throughout the project. We would then take that revenue, BH as the top line revenue, net out projected operating expenses, get to a net operating income line. We would then go to the financial markets. Based upon that net operating income, we could raise, in, in most cases, hundreds of millions of dollars that would be deployed during that initial development period to do replacement housing, renovations, all of those sorts of things. So that's, that's how the project You basically were, uh, borrowed against future revenues. Correct. Okay. And so the assumptions when you got into the contract, well, how have those assumptions been wrong? Um, the basic allowance for housing, again, is the only source of revenue for these projects. Um, BAH is reset annually. It's supposed to be indicative of the cost increases in the local market because the BH isn't just specific for the MHPI. No, I, I, I got it paid. More got importantly, paid. it's you know the, there's 70 percent folks that are living off. I see how bad it was. I got 124 a month. My apartment cost 250. <laughs> so. so BH has been highly unpredictable. We originally underwrote two to three percent annual increase. If you look at BH across the entirety of, of, of the DoD uh, spectrum, it looks more like an EKG. Chart. Okay, so so we, your expectation when you when you bid for the contract is two to two plus percent a year, that didn't happen. That That's didn't number happen. one. Okay, so have you lost money on? Let's take whichever project, Navy Southeast. Have you lost money on that project? We've not lost money. It's just the the 
the the the only we get paid management fees as a percentage of income. So if income doesn't go up, our fees don't go up. But more, how do you make money just on the management fees? Manage, management fees and for for the property management. We also get a return on that equity investment I talked about that we made at the front end. And that's at the, the very bottom of the cash flow. That's a separate, so you have a management fee over here and you have another company that was set up that took the risk on the, on the construction and the, is that the way it was set up? The, the company made an equity investment in the project to help fund that initial development period work. That the return on that equity, just like any investor in, in, a, in a real estate project would get, you get at, at, after all of the bills are paid, the mortgage is paid, then the way it's that leverage project, to the hilt. If you don't, if they only wanted one or one and a half percent equity, then it's just complete leverage, right? Significantly, yes. And why did the Navy want that? Uh, because we could tap into private sector capital. But the and markets were didn't encumber market, the federal. Interest rates were so low, you could get, and, and it didn't encumber the federal budget. So then, what happened? Now, did did the, did anybody change the deal? So you made they made assumptions. Their assumptions were wrong. Did the, did the um, Department of Defense change the deal ever? No. So it's just that the assumptions were wrong. So they so have they has it have they made? Is it okay if I just finish? So have they made money as the, as the the equity side where they bought the property and responsible for the fixing it up? Has that been a money loser for our company? Mm -hmm. No, it's not a loser. But but again, if 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 you, if revenues don't grow at the pace that you expected. You know, you're falling short of what you expected. Yeah. But it's, so the it's equity holders didn't make the return. It's still in a losing position. All right. So the management fee is not, is not the problem other than it seems like it's, it's, it's – when Senator Johnson asked you a question, the management fee per unit seems pretty low. I mean, I'm, I've never done a deal like that, but that seems low. Relative to what private sector companies do, it is low. Yeah. But you bid it, so you're responsible. We, bid we, bid, we, we got into this business because of, you know – as I said, I, fought, I served in the Navy myself. I, I, this business is attracted to me and always has been, and the reason that I work as tirelessly as I personally do is because I believe in, in the construct. I believe that it's a heck of a lot better way to, to provide housing to our service members and families than what we were capable of doing when I was in uniform. Light, and, light years of difference. So what would you do in hindsight? What should either you or the government have done differently to make sure there's less of a risk that you have rogue employees that do the wrong thing? Uh, for, in our case, had better internal controls. Mm -hmm. Is there anything the government should have done differently? Um, well, I think that, you know, there, there was certainly engagement from, from our military partners along the way. Uh, the FY 2020 NDA has, has really um, helped stoke the fire there, and, and I can tell you that we're, we're working more closely with our military partners than we've ever worked. And, uh, and I think that, you know, that's what the program ultimately needed. So you don't think, you don't think the structure of the, of the entity caused the problem? Maybe you think it was a lack of oversight? Yeah. Okay. I think it's fair. All right. Thanks. Thank you, Senator Scott. Um, Mr. Taylor, I want to uh, return to the question of whether indeed Balfour has reformed, improved its practices since 2019. Uh, again, the period of 2013 to 2019 is the period during which the company was, as you've acknowledged, engaged in a scheme to defraud the United States. Um, you made note in your opening remarks of satisfaction surveys that you've undertaken. Is that, in your view, an indicator of improved performance, or what, what does that signify in your opinion? It's, it's just one KPI that, that we pay close attention to because it's, it's direct feedback that comes from our residents through an, an independent third party anytime. As I said, all, all service members are invited to participate when they move into their new home or their home, once they take occupancy. They're invited to participate in the survey anytime we're in their home to provide um, Responsible work order, so it's an indicator. It's not the end all, be all, um, but it's a pretty good indicator, and we track that and see how how it trends over time, so that we can take action where we see things are trending in the wrong direction to investigate. You know why why are our scores dropping? What is it What is it about that 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 we need to be paying attention to 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 correct? 
Yeah, the reason that I'm skeptical of the satisfaction scores as an indication that you've improved your performance, and this is something that you and your team also raised in interviews before this hearing with with the subcommittee staff. Uh, If we could have a look, please, uh, at slide 16. Here we have your prepared testimony today at left. Uh, We have your predecessor in this role's prepared testimony from February of 2019 at Wright, testifying before the Senate. Now, just to make sure we have these dates correct, I want us to just clarify that February 2019, when your predecessor made these comments to the Senate, that was still during the period when the company was engaged in a scheme to defraud the United States. Is that correct? The the February 2019, that was still... Yes. Yes. Part of the period, yes. Okay. So here, here we have your predecessor touting satisfaction scores in sworn testimony before the Senate during a period when the company is engaged in a fraud scheme, falsifying, destroying work orders, lying to the armed services, and the company is touting its satisfaction scores. And then at left here, we have, once again, from your written statements today, the satisfaction scores as an indicator of your company's improvement in performance. Now, one to five or very good to outstanding, these may not be apples to apples comparisons, but it gets back to the core question. We can close the slide, which is why should the Senate believe that a company that for six years defrauded the government and I, I, I got to say, I'm, I'm shocked, Mr. Taylor, that you deny these issues are systemic. They are clearly systemic. In fact, your performance as a company at installations in my state is notorious. Local media have reported on it for years and years and years. Every time I visit an installation, enlisted personnel raise it without me even prompting them to. We've convened entire discussions with enlisted personnel to figure out what's going on. That's why we embarked upon an eight-month-long investigation to understand what's happening. I'm just not sure that you understand what's happening within your own organization. Did your senior executives know that for six years the company was engaging in fraud? No. So would you know now if your company was continuing to engage in fraud? Yes. You would. I'd like to to explore just whether or not your management team has the situational awareness to understand what's happening inside your own firm. If we could please turn to tab 13. And, And while you do that, uh, Mr. Taylor, if you could please tell the subcommittee who is Mr. Thomas Rodriguez and, and how was he related to you in the organization? Excuse me, tab 12, forgive me. And while you turn to tab 12, please, Mr. Taylor, who is Thomas Rodriguez? He's a former employee and former facility manager at Fort Gordon. Okay, he was the facility manager at Fort Gordon in Georgia. And, and prior to that, he was a, a, a facility, he was a maintenance supervisor at Fort Stewart. Understood. Thank you. So here we have an email uh, from Mr. Rodriguez. So as the facility manager at Fort Gordon, am I correct that um, perhaps not your direct subordinate, but he's your subordinate, correct? He's in my chain of command, yes, sir. That's right. And, And this email is from February of 2021. So this is two years after the conclusion of the period during which Balfour was engaged in this acknowledged scheme to defraud the United States. Two years later, Here's an email from Mr. Rodriguez, your subordinate. I'm not sure you received this email, Mr. Taylor, but you did, Ms. Cook. It was forwarded to you, in which Mr. Rodriguez says that the state of the facilities department at Fort Gordon is, quote, total chaos. He says, quote, words could not describe the total chaos, end quote. He further states that the facilities department at Fort Gordon has been lying to the Army about the condition of the facilities department at Fort Gordon. 
He says, quote, this is not acting honestly or respecting our third parties, meaning the army, and treating them with integrity and professionalism, end quote. Ms. Cook, you received this email in February of 2021, is that correct? Yes, I did. And what action did you take when you received this email reporting that there was total chaos in the facilities department at Fort Gordon and that, and again, this is from the head of the facilities department at Fort Gordon, and that the facilities department was being dishonest with the Army. What action did you take? I do not totally recall without reviewing the records, but I do believe I did forward this to um, up my chain of command. Um, okay, did you follow up after forwarding it to see what action was taken? Um, I believe we had a couple, because it was regarding the FM buildings. It was regarding the facility building, and I do believe I So you followed up. Mr. Taylor, were you aware of this email at the time? I was not. You were not aware. So you, you, you understand the skepticism. Let's just, again, set the stage here. It's been two years since the end of a six-year period when the company is engaged in a scheme to defraud the United States. At this very moment, February 2021, you're under Department of Justice investigation for being dishonest with the military, for fabricating and destroying work orders. You know you're under investigation. You know you're in hot water. And your subordinate reports that the facilities department at Fort Gordon is in total chaos and that with respect to the condition of the facility department and its premises, there's a lack of integrity with the Army. And you weren't aware of this, Mr. Taylor. You say that the senior executives at Balfour didn't know that there was fraud ongoing for six years, but that you would know if there was fraud ongoing now. How sure are you, Mr. Taylor, that you would know if that misconduct continued to this day? Are you sure? Well, I, I, think, that, I think that your interpretation of this email, what you, what you just described, doesn't align with, with the question that you're asking me. Okay, well, let me restate the question then, just for clarity. Here we have your subordinate reporting that when he took over the facilities department at Fort Gordon, it was in a state of total chaos and that the facilities department has been dishonest with the Army, correct? Where does it say that? Where does it say that? I, I, we got the document here. That, that's what it says. It says, when I arrived on site, words could not describe the total chaos that was the facilities department at Fort Gordon. You were not aware of this report, correct? I was not aware of this email. Okay. My time's expired. Ranking Member Johnson. So can you step through, after the settlement, uh, a couple of years ago, what specific actions did you take to correct the deficiencies in your process? I mean, specifically, I mean, what, what, what did you do? Yes, yeah, Senator, there, there were many. And, uh, and as we were working through them, I'll, I'll, sh I'll share that we were sharing that, those, those remediation plans with, with DOJ investigators as they were conducting their plan. We were sharing those remediation steps with our, our military partners. We were sharing that with Hask and SAF staffers that have oversight of, of this particular program. But there are a number of things, and, and I'll follow up with a more fulsome response, but, I, but I'll just share with you some of the things that we did. If you look at, you know, one of the root causes for the falsification of, of work order data was the system that we use, the database that we use is a, is a product called Yardi. Um, at the time, there, were, um, there was too much opportunity for those that use the system to manipulate data. So we worked with that provider. By, by the way, were they on bonus plans so that uh, manipulating data was to their individual benefit? So in other words, if you had, in your 1,400 employees, you had managers, uh, did they get get bonuses based on what their performance was off the Yardi system? The, the, the statistics, there was a portion of their, of their bonuses that, that came out in the investigation that, that their compensation was tied to performance. That's, that's correct. So that, is that still the case? It is not the case. Okay. Uh, none, no, it's, all of their bonus at site level is, is tied to customer satisfaction, um, where it ought to be. Um, is, is there any way for them to doctor this customer satisfaction? There's not. Surveys? It's all conducted by third parties. We don't conduct any surveys okay. our, ourselves. 
Um, but so that system had a lot of opportunity for manipulation of data. So we worked with the, the provider to ensure that local site teams have no ability to, to uh, um, change, change the data. We also engage a third party uh, call center now that takes 100% of our, our calls. And, and so you've got an independent third party that's documenting uh, the timing of the receipt, the date of the receipt of that work request, so that it's not our, our staff that are, that are in, uh, inputting that information. If there's a, if, if there's a, a recognized error in, in those uh, work orders, and I heard some of this in, in the previ previous testimony, local site teams cannot make those adjustments. That has to be ju documented, justified, and it has to be approved uh, up to a, a vice president level. If we make that change, we are transparent with our military partners for the reason why we made the change to ensure that there's, there's transparency and agreement with, with, with making that change. So do, do you know what you're being investigated for by the Department of Justice right now? Nothing that I'm aware of. Are, are you aware there is a Department of Justice investigation? Ongoing currently? Yeah. I'm not. Okay, no, nor was I. Ms. Cook, how, how do you explain the email from Mr. Rodriguez when he's talking about the facilities in chaos? What, what, what was in chaos, do you know? I believe, and if I may, Senator, um, I, I get thousands of emails in my email box every day, just as all of us do. So, you know, I definitely received it, um, but I do know that um, Tom went down there to um, help. We had lost a previous facility manager. I took it as his first observation of being on the ground, and he sent it to his supervisors that could help him pull it together um, in, in an action plan of how we're going to pull this to get... So again, this is kind of an initial uh, email when he gets down there and goes, man, this, this is a mess. This, this is in chaos, and I'm going to fix it for you. I mean, is that kind of how you interpreted That's it? That's kind of how I remember it. Like I said, I get thousands of emails, so I would have to go back and, okay. and review that, sir. But I do feel that Tom just had come on the ground, and he was re reporting of what he's seeing. Okay. At, on his so, business. Ms. Taylor, I, I want to go back, and I want to try and understand this business model. So tell, tell me if I've got this right. So there's the actual construction phase of this where you put in a very small percentage in terms of equity and you leverage it up and you're able to do that because it's housing for the military so nobody's you know, afraid that they're not going to get paid back. Uh, so, I mean, you can literally you know, build a billion dollars of uh, uh, housing and you're only investing what, 10 million maybe, 10, 10, and a half to 15, 10 to 15 million? Well, on, on that, I think every one of our projects, the, the equity contribution from the company was between 1% and 5%, so it, it varied. So, again, it could be 10 to 50 million. It, it could, yes. But, again, if, so if you're – but then your entire revenue stream is what you're telling me is, only, is $30 million a year. Our, our property management fees on average over the last three years – and that is, that is your revenue stream. Or is there some revenue stream from the construction part of this? I mean, are you making money on the construction? When, when in, in the initial development period, when we were building out the housing, we had a third party and then a related third party that was our builder. So again, you're, you're construct, let's say you construct a billion dollars, you're like a, act as a GC and you may be getting 10% for that. So you, you make money on the actual construction of the housing unit and then a that's done. A, a builder would have, but but Balfour Beatty, as the developer, we earn development fees for okay. the, the build out. Okay, of so you make money there, but but then ongoing, it's it's literally that thirty million dollars with fourteen hundred employees, with costs going up and down. I'm, I'm, again, the reason I'm digging in this, I wouldn't invest in this business. I'm, I'm just, you know, I, listen, I I guess I appreciate the fact that you've got a commitment and you want to provide good housing for our uh, service members, but unless I'm missing something here. It just seems like a pretty risky business. It's, it's not the only revenue source. That's the property management fees, Senator. I, I, just, want to be, I just want to make sure that we're, we're clear. So the way that the projects are constructed, the majority of the cash is left, left over after all the bills are paid. On average, about 90% 90, 90 of that goes to a project reinvestment account. That's there for long-term sustainment. It was always envisioned to be sufficient to take care of the housing over the balance of these 50-year agreements. That was, those reinvestment account funds are deployed in, in, in 
when, you know, when our military service partners are in agreement with what the plans for how we de deploy those, those funds to make further improvements down, down the road. When that happens, again, we will earn development fees on, on that work. We will engage contractors uh, to, to perform that work. So there's still opportunity for revenue or, or, or fees, but that was always envisioned in the construct of the deals. I talked about the equity investment that we made. 90% of that excess cash flow at the bottom of the waterfall goes to the reinvestment account. On average, about 10% comes to us as a return on that equity investment because we invested in the project as well. Okay, the, the reason I'm trying to delve into the finances here is if, if a company like yours is not making money on this or making such a slim margin, so there's probably not much incentive for you to improve things. But if, if you're making a fair return, uh, it's still a business that attra is attractive to you and others. I, 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 don't, I don't agree with the statement that it doesn't incentivize to do a good job and improve things. Frank, because everybody's well aware, our, our property management fees, that $30 million, is made up of a base management fee and then an incentive component. That incentive component was, was, was the issue that got us into the challenges with, with DOJ. But that incentive component, if we do our job well, there's opportunity for us to to earn more money for, for the business. We're, we're not a, we're not a, a not-for-profit. We're, we're a business just like every other provider is to, to try to be profitable. So again, to kind of, kind of close this out, in your mind, I, I think I heard you testify that the solution here is better internal controls on part of you and probably your competitors in this space. Absolutely. And you, you, you think with better internal controls, uh, you can satisfy the, you know, Miss Christians and our other are there uh, witnesses? We're, we're seeing evidence of it already. The, the level of control and oversight that, that we're, we have within our own organization, level of oversight uh, that we see from our military partners, there's, there's a lot more control over the, the act activities that are happening on every one of these installations. It's in a better place, a heck of a lot better place today than it was three years ago. So you have an independent company doing your surveys. Is there any other independent auditing of your performance? Uh, all of our Financials are independently audited. Shared um, financial, yeah. I'm yeah. just talking about in terms of your performance. The, the performance. Um, there's annual CEL surveys that the, that the service branches um, uh, engage. Um, you saw, you know, the, the the example that was on the screen on the right hand side of the screen was was the result of CEL scores that that the service branches engaged, and then we have satisfaction for those. Uh, so for the work we perform there. So this will be my last question, because I, I am disturbed uh, about potential retaliation. And we heard that from, I think, all, all the witnesses. And I, I've seen that it, since I came to the Senate, coming from the private sector. Uh, I'm actually shocked at how much retaliation there is kind of within government, okay? And, and this would be within the military. Uh, are you aware of that? And it sounds like, you know, based on testimony, it's retaliation uh, certainly participated in by uh, members of Belfort staff kind of in combination with the, uh, some of the folks in the military. I'm not aware of our staff retaliating against residents because they, they've expressed displeasure with our service. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Ranking Member Johnson. And, and uh, just to close out, I think it's, it's worth – recapping what you were getting into, Ranking Member Johnson, in terms of the structure of revenues. So just for, for clarity, with our final few moments here, uh, Mr. Taylor, uh, just describe one more time how this incentive fee structure operates, please. It, 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 so if, if you look at the, the cash flow waterfall for any project, as part of the operating expenses, there's typically a, a base management fee. It's usually on the order of 2% of revenues. After debt service is paid, after we put away money for capital repairs and replacement, we will qualify for incentive management fees. There's a, there's a slight differences, but a lot of similarity between the way that each branch of service has negotiated the performance metrics within those. All of them have undergone uh, a revamping in the last three years. And, and if I might, those incentive fees, for example, the incentive payments that you will receive from that joint fund you've established with the service uh, will be correlated with your performance, and uh, among the metrics of performance will be the timely and successful closure of work orders, correct? The, the timely response to 
emergency and urgency, the timely completion of routine service. Right. right, so if there's an issue such as mold, which poses a health hazard, then that's classified differently with a different expectation of successful or timely response than, for example, uh, a routine carpentry issue. Is that correct? That is correct. So when we see Sergeant Torres's work order where he clearly stated in the description that it's mold, and then we see that it was classified as carpentry, that kind of thing could impact your incentive fees, correct? If the company, and this is, uh, I believe, what was going on during the period of the scheme to defraud the United States, misclassification of a request for remediation of mold, which should be more timely acted on as something like carpentry, will cause you to be paid more in incentive fees by artificially inflating your performance metrics, correct? If if the volume of that activity rose to the level that we would not meet the threshold, that's a correct statement. And, and it assumes that we, don't, we didn't identify the error and, and put in place a, a correct, you know, correct the error. But, but again, to, to, to achieve the, the incentive fees, just to, be, just to be totally transparent, it doesn't mean 100% um, success to qualify. There are, there, there are graduated levels depending on, on that. So, one or two work orders in and of itself being an error would not potentially impact whatsoever uh, our incentive fees. Thank you, Mr. Taylor. Thanks for that clarification. I want to thank the members who attended this hearing today. I want to thank all of the witnesses in both panels for their testimony and for appearing today before the subcommittee. We will continue to seek remedies for the issues discussed today. Our military personnel, stateside and abroad, sacrifice continually in service to this nation, as do their families. They deserve the very best. It is of utmost importance that they be provided with safe housing, that there be accountability within the department and by those companies responsible for providing that housing. This hearing record will remain open for 15 days for any additional comments or questions by any of the subcommittee members. And with that, this hearing is adjourned.